Now I do. Okay, and ladies and gentlemen, good evening, Democrats. Good evening, good evening, Democrats. Good evening Democrats. Good evening. Okay, okay. Let's try uh, having everybody participate this time. <laughs> Unmute. And now, good evening, Democrats. Good, good evening, evening, Democrats. Democrats. Good evening, Democrats. Good evening, Democrats. All right. That sounded. That sounded good. Now we're going to mute everybody again, and anybody should be able to unmute themselves uh, as necessary. So, folks, we've got a packed schedule, a lot to get to tonight. Uh, our big annual or biannual primary endorsement meeting, and we're going to get right to it. But we have one last candidate uh, to speak before we get to the judges, and that is uh, our friend, uh, County Assessor Jeffrey Prang. Uh, Assessor, good to see you. Nice to see you all as well. Thank you very much. So thanks for joining us. And uh, we wanted to give you the opportunity before we vote, you know, to let us know about your, uh, how things are going at the Assessor's Office and your reelection campaign. Sure, well I, well, I know that you're ticking off the meeting and you probably want to do it in a way that adds a little bit uh, of excitement to this uh, meeting and what better way to do that than with a speech from the uh, county property tax assessor. Um, but uh, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about my office and some of the things we've done. I'll try to be, try to be quick. Um, as the assessor, I'm one of three countywide elected officials, probably the least well-known of the three, the uh, sheriff and the district attorney are the other two. Um, I run the largest um, local property assessment agency in the United States. Got about 1,200 employees and six offices. Uh, we're responsible for establishing the value for about two and a half million real estate parcels and business assessments annually, which last year were valued at $1.7 trillion, which generated about 17 to $18 billion in property taxes, which is, as you know, was allocated to schools, city government, and county services. I always tell my employees that in a lot of ways that my office is the most important local government agency because no other lo local government agency can do their job till I've done mine. And if I don't do it well and efficiently, then property tax revenues that rightfully should be going into vital services is, uh, uh, is overlooked. Uh, when I was elected assessor seven years ago, you may recall that the department was in disarray due to a uh, corruption scandal with my predecessor. Um, I was elected and I enacted sweeping reforms which were designed to uh, restore integrity and accountability to the office. And I think we've been very successful. We've transformed the office into what is one of the most well-regarded agencies of its type in the United States. We've implemented dramatic upgrades in our department's technology platform, which has improved employee efficiency and public service. Uh, we've helped homeowners, seniors, veterans, nonprofit organizations save um, in 2021, $650 million. We provided proactive property tax relief to over 40,000 small businesses that were negatively impacted by COVID in restaurants and retail stores as well as uh, to a number of uh, to, to victims of the wildfires that plagued us all in recent years. One of my most uh, uh, recent and proudest accomplishments is developing an innovative workforce development program with local community colleges to help me fill a number of vacancies that uh, occur due to annual attrition. Um, these are you know, highly trained positions and uh, uh, by working with the community colleges, we're providing a pipeline of jobs of pre-trained qualified people into the county government, which provides good jobs, good pay, good retirement. At the same time, it provides um, opportunities for community college students to get, uh, to get these jobs. Um, I've worked really hard over the last seven years to try to increase the awareness and public education about our department. Um, uh, it's, the property tax system is, can be very confusing and I've worked hard to make it uh, more easily to easy to navigate. And I think that the reforms and innovations that I've led have added tremendous value to the people of LA County. Um, I think most of you uh, know, or maybe don't know that I've been act an active Democrat for many years as a, a past club president and uh, current member of the County uh, Central Committee, State Central Committee, and as a member of the State Executive Board. I'm proud to be the officially endorsed candidate of the LA County Democrat Party, and I'm uh, as well as a, a dozens of unions, uh, unions and, and Democratic clubs from across the, uh, the county. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you this evening and uh, hopefully to earn your support as well. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, always good to see you and uh, appreciate uh, you stopping by. 
Absolutely. Good to see you all. All right, folks. So we've got uh, our our uh, judicial candidates form now to to uh, hear from uh, a few dozen judicial candidates running across nine seats. And uh, before we start, I wanted to take a moment to thank Michael Soloff and Derek Devermont, who uh, are part of our judicial endorsements committee, and and they have for the last couple cycles spent a lot of time meeting with all of these candidates and getting to know them and making the uh, recommendations to our board, which we then use to make our recommendations to the membership tonight. Uh, so really appreciate all the time they put into this uh, committee. And uh, we're going to hear from our candidates. Uh, well, we're going to go out of order by one race, uh, Mr. Rubin. Uh, so we're going to start with seat 60 and uh, uh, one candidate who has to be in another engagement. So we want to go first to Anna Raitano. Each candidate will get uh, one minute to speak, and then we'll move on to the next candidate in the same seat. And the candidate I selected at random as far as the order for each seat. So Anna, you'll, you'll begin. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'm Anna Slotky Raitano. I'm running for seat 60. As a public defender, I'm offering a fresh perspective that's informed, diverse, and substantive. My career has been dedicated to ensuring fairness and safeguarding people's constitutional rights, as well as fighting for alternatives to the revolving door of prison, which the other candidates cannot say. The legislature has passed laws addressing reform. The problem is the bench does not have enough people who understand, agree with, or straight up refuse to utilize those laws as intended. I will acknowledge the laws that have already been passed, and will continue to be passed. What I bring to the table is necessary to realize that. I've been endorsed by over 15 or more than 15 organizations who recognize this, including Ground Game LA, Crescenta Kenyatta Democratic Club, the Culver City Democratic Club, Southern California Armenian Democrats, and the Democratic Party of the San Fernando Valley. I won the most votes in the LA County Democratic Party and I held up the endorsement process in that race. Um, elected officials like Laura Friedman, Senator Portantino, and Isaac Bryan have also endorsed me. And I'm also supported by multiple doctors who work with the courts. Thank you, ma'am. Your time Thank you. is up. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll I gave you a little bit. Of, yeah, I, I just like to say I gave her a little bit of extra time because her, she did freeze at one point so it may be 15 seconds more than that's okay but you know. appreciate it all right yeah uh thanks peter and now we'll hear from uh and again i'll say the names and if the person's here we'll we'll go to them and if not we'll we can come back if they come later so the next candidate is troy slayton okay so uh if anybody sees or hears from uh troy you can they can speak later and now we'll go to sharon ransom thank you good evening and thank you for allowing me to speak um what we need on the bench are not advocates for one side or the other what we need are balanced judges that understand the rights of the defendants as well as the rights of victims um we need diversity, not only in appearance, but in thought and in action. I am the most diverse candidate running for seat 60. I was born and raised in South Central. Um, I was a single parent, raised by a single parent, cancer survivor. I've been a deputy district attorney for 17 years in the um, mental health unit now. I've been rated well qualified by the LA County Bar Association. I have also have the endorsements of several democratic clubs as well as over 30 judges and um, community leaders and pastors. I represent more of the people that walk into the court than the people that work in the court. I have a better understanding of our diverse communities and that's what we need in judges. We don't need someone that advocates for defendants because there's a whole system. This is national- Thank you, your time right is up. Week. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sharon. And now Abby Barron. Okay, so that's it for seat 60. And now we'll return to seat three, Timothy Rubin. Good evening to everyone. I'm Tim Rubin and I'm running for office number three 
there's a judge there right now, but she won't be there for long. President Biden nominated her and she's almost gone before the full Senate and is going on to the federal district court. So who am I? I live in Brentwood with my wife, Stephanie, and my 15-year-old daughter, uh, who I just bought mitzvah at university on Sunset. And I am also a father of three other kids. I graduated from Harvard Law School 40 years ago, after, oh, over 40 years ago, and have been practicing law in Los Angeles ever since. And I've had every kind of case. I started my own law firm 30 years ago. It's on Wilshire Boulevard, very close to Santa Monica. I'm also proud to have been endorsed by the LA County Democratic Party as well. I know I'm running out of time, so thank you for letting me speak. Great, thank you. You got it. You got in before the buzzer. Okay, and now we'll move on to seat sixty-seven. We'll hear from Ryan Dibble. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for hearing from me. Um, I've been a deputy DA for sixteen years. Uh, went to USC for accounting on scholarship in law school, and I'm proud to be an adjunct lecturer in law there now. I'm a community volunteer and also serve as a volunteer temporary judge. I've been rated well qualified by the LA County Bar Association and, and also endorsed by the Torrance Democratic Club and by three dozen uh, sitting uh, Superior Court judges in the Metropolitan News Enterprise. I'm running for judge because I feel like uh, that I would bring fair minded justice to the bench and I would also uh, provide the sense <laughs> that everybody in the courtroom had been heard. I would bring a valuable sense of perspective over the course of my career as a district attorney and I would have high expectations of the prosecutors who would come through my courtroom as a result. And so I think that I would be a fair judge um, and would humbly ask for your endorsement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, now let's hear from Elizabeth Lashley Haynes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I just arrived in Virginia. I'm out of town for work, so I apologize. I'm logging on last minute um, just after arriving. Thank you so much for allowing me time to speak with you all today. My name is Elizabeth Lashley Haynes. I'm a deputy public defender, and I've been doing that for almost 20 years now. Um, I currently work in the Racial Justice Act unit where I litigate bi claims of bias um, involved in our legal system. I am the endorsed candidate of the LA County Democratic Party, Dipsiv, Stonewall, Culver City Dems, Progressive Santa Monica Dem Party, and many more. I was recently endorsed by Anthony Portentino and Assembly Member Ash Kalra. Um, I hope you all would consider endorsing me. I have a new vision of how I would like to see the judicial bench be more impartial and provide equity um, and equal justice to all the citizens of LA County so that we could reimagine safer neighborhoods that are based on a smarter approach to implementing justice. And thank, thank you for having you. me here tonight. I'm up. Thank you. And now we'll hear from, uh, oh, well, uh, I don't think Fernanda Barreto is here, is, is she? Uh, she mentioned, she emailed me to let me know she couldn't make it, so just checking. Okay, and so now we'll uh, move to the next seat, number 70, and we'll hear from Renee Chang. Okay, not, uh, not, not seeing Renee, so let's go to Eric Teresa's. And of course, if there's someone here who is an official surrogate for the campaign, you can you can uh, speak up as well uh, for these folks. Okay, then we'll go to Holly Hancock. Good evening and thank you for having me. Hey, My name is Holly Hancock and I'm running in seat number 70. And um, I, I'm running to give the voters a choice. Uh, I believe that my professional background and the way that I practice my practice differentiates me from my prosecutor colleagues. I am a deputy public defender. And for the past 16 years, I have fought for the constitutional rights of people in the criminal court system. I've tried 65 trials of jury verdict. I've won or had reductions in about 80% of those. But the case trajectory is much less extreme on a daily basis. 
I have to see the effect on the client and their families generationally, as well as the victims and their families. And sometimes and lots of times those families are the same. For this reason, I practice long-term solution building for the client and the community. Um, I have to know the root cause of the problem. And that's where I'm coming from. I have um, for the last two years been the deputy in charge of the uh, homeless mobile unit, criminal record clearing. And um, thank for you. Your time is up. House, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Holly. And now uh, Matthew Vadnoy. Yes, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Vadnoy. I also am running for seat 70. Uh, I would like to point out that I am the only person running in this seat who actually has been both a defense attorney and stood next to people charged with crimes who were truly innocent, fought for their freedom and got them their freedom. At the same time has been a prosecutor. I was a prosecutor for 14 years. I am the only one that understands what it means to represent everyone in the courtroom. This is not just about the defense attorneys and the public defenders and who they've protected on their rights. Their rights matter, but so do victims. And what we need is to eliminate bias. We don't eliminate bias by adding bias. We don't eliminate the bias from the prosecutors that are on the bench that are overly harsh by putting on public defenders who are overly lenient, who don't care for the victims. I do, I understand them both. I am your diverse candidate in terms of understanding the entire courtroom and representing everyone and making sure everyone is treated fairly. Thank, Thank you. you, time is up. Thank you, and now uh, Randy Fudge. Okay, and now we'll move on to seat 90. And we'll start with, um, I'll see if she's here, Melissa Lyons. Here. Great, hey, Melissa, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Again, Melissa Lyons running for seat 90. I only have a minute, so I'm going to talk really fast. I'm running because of impact. Impact is important, and impact comes from better decision making. Better decision making comes from diversity on the bench, because when you understand people, when you have been around people and know what they've been through, you know and how to make better decisions for people. And that's why I'm running. I'm running not be just because I'm Black, just because I'm a woman or just because I'm an immigrant, because cultural competency is more than just those three things. It includes the work that I've done in, in the community because I believe that people on the bench also need to be important parts of their community. I've done the Summer Night Lights program, uh, which does free cap, uh, classes in the park. I do Project LEAD. I've done Global Girl Project and I've been a DA for 16 years. I'm currently the supervisor for Compton Juvenile Division. I'm endorsed by SEIU 721 Stonewall, uh, East Area Progressive Thank Democrats, you, your time and is many up. other Democratic clubs. I hope to earn your endorsements. Thank you, Melissa. And now we'll hear from Kevin McGurk. Uh, thank you. My name is Kevin McGurk. I'm running for seat 90. Uh, and the elevator pitch is to blend the requisite experience with the right experience. I've been a public defender for 17 years. Almost every weekday during that time, I've been in the courtroom. For 13 of the last 14 years, I've been in felony trials. I've got about 50 open ones right now, including multiple complex murders. Um, my last 10 trials involved serious or violent charges. My last two were murders. What you're getting is an experienced trial lawyer, experienced in trying serious cases. I've rate, been rated well qualified by the LA County Bar Association. That's the requisite experience. The right experience is bringing a diversity to a perspective. In the last 10 years, 43 seats have gone to the voters, zero to the defense. At that rate, you're going to have a portion of your criminal bench that has never been to a jail. There are plenty of judges with prosecutorial backgrounds that are outstanding, but that is problematic. If diversity of perspective is an issue for you, it's something to focus on. I've been endorsed by the LA County Democratic Party. I've got the experience and temperament to apply the law fairly, irrespective of the political winds outside of the courthouse. It's not about being hard or soft. Thank you. Time is up. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And now we'll hear from Leslie Gonzalez. Uh, okay, and uh, not hearing from Leslie, so. John, John oh. there was a candidate named Leslie Gutierrez. She may not be present, but I think the name is not Gonzalez. Sorry about that if I got it wrong. Is, 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 uh, is she here? Thanks for that, Janice. Sorry about that. Gutierrez. 
appreciate the correction. Uh, uh, so is Leslie here? Okay, so we'll move on to seat 16, 116, which is Lloyd Handler. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Lloyd Handler. I'm also a deputy public defender. I probably have more actual ongoing experience in the courtroom than any candidate running. I've been uh, started in the DA's office in 1989, went to the public defender's office in 1990, also spent four years in private criminal practice in the Bay Area from 2000 to 2004. Uh, I am running uh, because it's been clear from my experience in the courtroom that a number of judges have not caught on that ideas of how to make communities safe through the justice system are changing, focusing on rehabilitation, identifying problems in uh, people in the justice system that can be fixed and actually spending judicial and community resources on fixing those problems since most people that go to prison are ultimately going to come out. And if you pass up a chance to rehabilitate someone who does not yet need to go to prison, uh, because they can be rehabilitated. You're just getting a worse, more informed criminal on the back end of things. Thank you. Your time is up. Uh, thank you. And and uh, now we'll go to uh, seat 118. And the first candidate is Keith Coyano. Is Keith here? Okay. And uh, moving on to the next candidate, Shan Thever. All right, and our next candidate, Georgia Huerta. Hello, everyone. My name is Georgia Huerta, and I'm candidate for seat 118. I'm a long life Democrat. I'm qualified to be a Superior Court judge based on my life experience. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles with my mother and six siblings, and I got to witness the criminal justice system not at its best. Also, based on my legal experience, I have been a deputy district attorney for over 30 years. I left the office last year in 2021 and leaving the office, I was uh, in the alternative sentencing court for three years that dealt with uh, rehabilitation and uh, treatment as opposed to uh, incarceration. Also, I would like to tell you that I have tried over 80 cases. I've been more than a trial deputy, I've been a calendar deputy, I've been a filing deputy and a juvenile deputy. I have been rated well qualified by the Los Angeles County Bar Association. I have earned the endorsement of the California Democratic Party, uh, the National Women's Political Caucus, uh, Law PAC, and uh, uh, over two dozen judges. Uh, I have also earned the endorsement. Thank you. Thank you. Your you time much. is up. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. And next up, Melissa Hammond. Hi, Melissa may be trying to call in. If you want to skip over and come back to her in a second. Yeah, sure. I did see her uh, pop into the Zoom a minute ago. That's, uh, that's why. John, please make it clear we know what office each person is running for. It's a little hard to- I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. So just to Janice's point just now that we're currently looking at seat 118 and uh, this one has quite a few. That may be why <laughs> there's a question. So. Uh, the next candidate, she just popped in, Melissa Hammond. Go, go Hi. ahead. Hi, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, go uh, ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Melissa Hammond. I'm running for Office 118. I'm a voting member of this club. I oppose the current recommendation in seat 118. Why are we recommending a candidate who, unknown to LACDP at the time of their endorsement, does not even practice law and has not practiced law for even a minute since March of 2021? A candidate who's only ever been a DA and re retired one at that. There are so many more qualified candidates in this race, including myself, who still practice law and have well-qualified ratings from LACBA. Candidates like myself who have held legal careers other than only as a district attorney. I've been a public defender. I've been in civil litigation. I've been in administrative law. So therefore I oppose the current recommendation uh, where a lot of us are well-qualified and I practice law and I'm currently a deputy DA. I'm following all the new directives and I am very well versed in the new directives. I'm also well versed in the law that's currently standing. So I don't understand why somebody is being recommended who does not practice law. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up is Carolyn G. Young Park. 
Thank you. Hello, fellow Democrats. I've been a practicing attorney for over 18 years, and a third of my career was spent at a public sector union representing about 9,000 state workers throughout LA County in administrative hearings and in civil court. I've also represented immigrants and people exercising their constitutional rights, and I'm currently handing, handling a lawsuit against the Sheriff's Department. The kind of diversity on the bench that we need is judges with experience representing community members, not more prosecutors or corporate defense attorneys. That's why I'm endorsed by Unite Here Local 11, Council Member Mike Bonin, Assembly Member Isaac Bryan, Assembly Member, Member Ash Kalra, and so many more. Meanwhile, Ms. Huerta is endorsed by Jackie Lacey and is a career DA. My perspective is informed by working with regular working people and allows me to apply the law fairly and equitably without giving undue credit to any side. I would be honored to serve the people of LA County as judge of the Superior Court in Office 118. Thank you. Thank you, your time is up. Thank you, and finally, Clint McKay. Thank you. Uh, I am the only candidate in the entire race, not just in this seat, who has actually decided cases as a judge. For the last seven and a half years, I have been an administrative law judge, and last year I was elevated to presiding judge. I currently supervise a panel of judges, and I mentor them and train them to be better judges. That's what I've done. I've been a judge for the last seven and a half years. I've decided thousands of cases as a judge. Uh, before that, I was a deputy attorney general with the Attorney General's Office in the Health Quality Enforcement Section. I was in practice for 25 years before that. I have an anniversary this year. I voted in my first Democratic election in 1972 for George McGovern, as, as some others said. I have been voted Democratic in every single election since then for 50 years. I tried my first case in 1978. I have more experience trying cases. I've tried hundreds of cases than anybody else in this race. I have tried hundreds of cases, both here in California, in New York, in Michigan, I also have a license in England and Wales and before the Supreme Court of the United States, as well as a number of federal district Thank courts. Thank you very much. Time is up. I appreciate your endorsement. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the next seat, seat number 151. And we have two candidates in this seat. The first one is Patrick Hare. Good evening. My name is Patrick Hare, and I've been a public defender for over 30 years. I'm running for judge for the same reason I became a public defender, and that is my heartfelt conviction that justice matters. And when I say justice, I mean the kind of justice that restores our community to wholeness for victims of crime, absolutely, but also for those accused of crimes. In the courtroom, I've tried over 100 cases, both civil and criminal, ranging from dependency to conservatorships to special circumstance murder cases. I've been rated well qualified by the LA County Bar, I've been endorsed by the LA County Democratic Party, Stonewall, East Area Progressive, Dipsiv, and would be honored to add uh, the support of Santa Monica Democrats uh, to that list. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. And is Richard Canones here? Okay, so we'll now move on to the uh, last seat of the evening, which is seat number 156. And first up is Albert Robles. Okay, and not seeing Albert, so let's go to Carol Ellswick. Good evening, my name is Judge Carol Ellswick, and I'm happy to be here this evening, and thank you. I have 30 years of judicial experience, including 22 years as a Los Angeles Superior Court judge. During that period of time, I've presided over an estimated 60,000 cases. I have judicial experience of that 60,000 cases. I have the endorsement of the LA County Democratic Party, the Los Angeles, correction, the Los Long Beach Democratic Party, Stonewall, Advance, as well as over 100 um, Los Angeles Superior Court judges. I presided over felony jury trials, preliminary hearings, including murder, attempted murder, assault with a deadly weapon, rape, uh, domestic violence cases. I've supervised 10 judges and commissioners as a site judge. I've supervised um, small claims departments as well as the traffic departments. I'm seeking your endorsement and thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Carol. And so that uh, brings us to the end of the list. Now, before we go on, I just wanted to ask, because there's definitely some people coming in and out. So were there any candidates running for 
LA Superior Court judge today who didn't just get a chance to speak. Okay, great. So, so that's everybody. Uh, so, so thank you, everyone. And uh, oh, uh, I think before we excuse you, Peter Bradley had a, a comment to share. Yes, um, I hope. I, I think sometimes we we take uh, the uh, judges a little bit too lightly. It's I point to this the woman in Florida who was rated unqualified by the American Bar Association, yet the Senate of the United States approved her. Then she makes a decision on masks without even hearing oral arguments and uh, tries to apply it to the entire United States, saying that the CDC doesn't have the right to order uh, masks and other su such things for uh, protection of people in a pandemic. So I hope that everybody will take it very seriously, uh, voting for judges. And um, if you've learned something about some of these judges, uh, we'd be happy to hear it in the next few minutes as we talk about these uh, candidates. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. So uh, what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna ask the candidates for judge um, to please step out from the meeting. And if also if you're a consultant or uh, working on the campaign of a judge to please step out of the meeting. And uh, we're gonna have a, a discussion amongst the membership uh, before we proceed with the next step of the meeting and before we vote. So I wanna thank all of you for coming by. And uh, you're certainly welcome to come back in maybe about a half an hour or so to, to observe the rest of the meeting, but maybe you've got another, uh, another event to go to, that's fine too. So thank you everybody for coming. And uh, we're gonna now uh, ask you to, to please step out if you're a judge, if you're well, a, thank uh, you for your time. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Okay, so we're back. So thanks everybody for a very uh, insightful discussion. And we're going to let the folks who were in, been in the waiting room uh, come back in. So they're uh, making their way back in. So thank you to, to Mike and Derek and Joel and everybody who who uh, lent their expertise in, in our conversation. Uh, and now we're going to move on to discuss some of the other uh, races that are before us this evening. And I put together a little slideshow to see where we are. So first of all, uh, here's our agenda. We're about halfway through. We're up, getting coming up to number four right now. We'll be doing our voting on some of the races. We'll, we'll go through this in just a second. Uh, so first of all, I just want to make sure to answer, this is probably a, going to be a frequently asked question, so let's just get out of the way here. There was a bylaw change approved in November, and the change is that you can only vote uh, on an endorsement if you live in the district where that uh, rate, where that if basically, if your ballot will have that race on it, then you can vote in our endorsement. So if you live in Santa Monica, you're going to be able to vote on everything that the club endorses. If you live, uh, you know, just on the other side uh, in L.A. City, then for Santa Monica City Council, you won't be able to vote when we get to that in September. But tonight, the uh, supervisor race and the assembly race are gonna be on separate ballots. So many members are going to get three emails that will have most of the, we'll go through it in, in a second, but uh, you'll see. But I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that it's because of this bylaws change that uh, we're, we're doing it that way. Okay, so voting schedule. So first we're gonna to go to the consent calendar. This is for incumbents that have no other Democrats in the race. And we're going to do two votes by voice or by hand. These are incumbents who also are, are effectively running unopposed, but because of the district's 
we're going to do those separately to make sure that only people in those districts are voting. And then finally, all of the contested races where there's more than one Democrat, um, some clubs, you know, uh, have a somebody who's automatically recommended and you have to pull it. And the way that we do it here is everyone that's a contested race, we're just going to go straight to the ballot. You'll get your vote by election buddy and you can vote however you want. Okay, so first we're going to come back to this slide in a few minutes, but first of all, these are our consent calendar races. Uh, these are the races where there's no other Democrat running, but these will be on our primary ballot. Uh, governor, Lieutenant Governor. So somebody muted me. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, you can see on our consent calendar will be Gavin Newsom for governor, Eleni Kunalakis for Lieutenant Governor, Shirley Weber for Secretary of State, Fiona Ma for Treasurer, Rob Bonta for Attorney General, Tony Thurman for Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Vasquez for Board of Equalization, District 3, Alex Padilla, who's running both for a special election and for the primary for his full term uh, as the Senator. So we'll technically be voting on that on two different races. And finally, our speaker from earlier this evening, Jeffrey Prang. So we're gonna come back to that in just a second. Just wanted to put that on the burner for everyone to know what's coming up in just a minute. Then we're gonna go to these two races, uh, which are by district. So we'll ask you if you on the honor system uh, to vote by hand for these two districted uh, races where the Democrats are looking pretty good. And then we will finally have our three ballots, like I was mentioning earlier. So the first ballot will have state controller, state insurance commissioner, and county sheriff, and all nine judge races. Ballot number two will have LA County Superior District, LA County Supervisor District Three. And then ballot three will have Assembly District 51. So if you, so only members who live in District 3 or District 51 will actually get those ballots. So if you live um, in Isaac Bryan's Assembly District, or say you live in Holly Mitchell's Supervisor District, you're not going to get a chance to vote on those two races this evening. Okay, so we're now going to go back to the consent calendar. And I think everybody can see it on the screen. Um, we wanted to see if there's a motion to uh, endorse I'll move, John. candidates. A second. Okay, and and sorry, who was the maker of the motion? Me, me, me. Ford. Okay. Anastasia <laughs> and Ford are the maker of the motion, Peter. And uh, the seconder is Keith. Keith Coleman. Okay, so all in favor for our consent. Wait, is, pay, is Ford a paid member? Can he, uh, can he? He's on the family plan. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but he, he's not old enough to vote. I mean, should we kick him out? He's, uh, he's, in, he's in under the rule, under the bylaws, which say that as long as he pledges to be a Democrat when he becomes 18, then he's good to go. Who did uh, you vote for yeah, the president just... for at your preschool? All right, well, so we, while, while we wait for Ford to tell us, let's uh, have the, uh, the, mo the motion that's on the floor. So all in favor? Joe Raise Biden? <laughs> Here you go. That sounds like a good Democrat. <laughs> okay, I see, uh, I see four. Or just said that he voted for Joe Biden to everyone. <laughs> That's my buddy. Huh? Uh, okay, so so Peter looks like we've got uh, 40, 45, 46. About uh, about 40, about 46 hands up. Okay, Peter. And uh, let's yeah, all. I got it. Let's all lower the hands.
Okay, and as the hands are, are uh, lowering, going through and sort of clicking them one by one. Okay, so uh, anybody who opposes the motion? Not seeing, just, just checking, because uh, there's a couple of hands up, so I just want to make sure. Okay, so the no, no opposition. Okay, great. So uh, the, the motion, oh, any abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. So congratulations, Governor Newsom. I think that's gonna put him over the top for, for re-election, but we'll see. We've got some competitive races there. So we'll be coming back to that in the, <laughs> for the general when we see what their opponents look like, because some of them are gonna have some Republican opposition. Um, okay, let's go back to uh, the next uh, the next item. So now we're going to ask that uh, the, we're going to uh, take up uh, Congressional District 36. This is the new District 36, which Ted Lieu is representing. And so if you don't live in Ted Lieu's Congressional District, we're going to ask you to please not participate in this vote, even if you are a member of the club. This is only if you live in Ted Lewis Congressional District. Uh, okay, so now we wanna know if there's a motion to endorse our recommended candidate of Ted Lieu. I would love to be able to move that. Okay, moved by Janice. Do we have a second? Second. Who seconded that? So that was me. Oh, Sorry, Brad. Brad. Okay. Brad, okay, yeah. Oh, okay, got it. Bradley seconds. Uh, okay. Um, all in favor? Seven thirty eight. Looks like we got thirty eight. Peter, thirty nine. All right, let's lower the hands. Okay, and now all who oppose the motion. Okay. There were some I, hands that were not lowered. I hope they're not being counted again. Um, um, yeah, they, they, they got it. Uh, okay, great. So now anyone who opposes the motion and any abstentions? This is Rick. I just wanna make clear, I don't live in the uh, Lou district. I love Congressman Lou, so I'm, I'm in the ship district. That's why I didn't vote. Thanks, Rick. And uh, and uh, now let's let's uh, so so the motion passes unanimously. So congratulations, Congressman Liu. And uh, now let's go to the next race, which is Senate District uh, Twenty Six. I'd like and to move for Ben Allen. <laughs> it's Isabel. Isabel makes the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Shy. Okay, so. All in favor, raise your hand. Thirty-eight. Looks like we're about forty. Okay, let's let's call that forty. Let's lower the hands. And uh, last couple going down, <laughs> lowered. Okay, now all, all opposed. Okay, any abstentions? All right, another unanimous vote for Senator Allen. And uh, I see that he's here, but we'll, we'll let him uh, speak in just a few moments when we, when we get to his Q and A. Um, congratulations, Senator. Uh, okay, and so now it's time to go to our uh, contested races. And uh, we want to uh, want to take a moment to just say before we get to this part that I want to make sure we are encouraging as many members as possible to participate in this section. Uh, that means hearing from a wide variety of perspectives. 
And so let's try to remember as we proceed that we're all Democrats, we're all passionate about our candidates. We wanna be mindful of our civility pledge and we wanna be kind to each other, even on these primary race disagreements. But this is your opportunity to speak up and impact the vote outcome. Uh, so every member of this club, whether it's your first uh, meeting that you're in good standing, or if you've been a member of this club for 30 years, you should feel welcome to participate uh, as we go through these candidates. And I also just want to mention that we're not going to send out the ballot out until we finish discussing all of these races. So uh, I know that sometimes it, the ballot comes in the middle of the discussion. So we're going to wait until the end before we actually mail it, email it out. Um, the, they're going to come in your email. Uh, election buddy in just a few minutes. Okay, so the first race we're going to discuss, um, and by the way, for these races, I'm going to mention the names of the candidates in chronological order of their first appearance at the Santa Monica Democratic Club. So uh, for controller, the first race we'll be discussing this evening, Ron Galperin, Yvonne Yu, Malia Cohen, and Steve Glazer are the four Democratic candidates. And Steve Glazer got into the race pretty late. Uh, we did reach out to him and his campaign to try to get him to come, but we never heard back uh, in any capacity. And I know that speaking candidly that he's, he's running a very centrist, moderate style race. Uh, so it's not that surprising that, that uh, we got a little dissed. So we're gonna open it up um, to the floor. And if you're interested in speaking for these candidates, uh, we'll be calling on you. So um, let's start with the board's recommendation, which is Malia Cohen. Uh, is there somebody who'd like to speak on Ms. Cohen's behalf? Uh, Carolyn, go ahead. Greetings, thank you, I'll be brief. Um, I was able to hear Malia, as I'm sure the body was last week. I think um, you asked her some very insightful questions. Uh, I think I should have prefaced it with, look, I love Ron Galperin. Uh, Ron has done a phenomenal job and he deserves credit for the job he's done. But candidly, Malia has a little more experience being board of supervisors, being BOE chair, attending many of the meetings with the Lenny and the controller right now, somewhat doing the job already. And I think uh, the party's endorsement uh, was a good one. And I'm hoping that this club, uh, after hearing her, will support that recommendation. See, I told you I'd be brief. <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. So now I wanna see if there's someone who wants to speak uh, on behalf of one of the other candidates in this race. For Ron Galperin or uh, Yvonne Yu or Steve Glazer. Okay. Oh, uh, Dorothy, go for it. So I think like a lot of you, I've known Ron Galpin for a long time and I have to respect and give him credit for what he's done in Los Angeles, especially in digging into this homelessness issue and finding out that this county, was, the city was spending $600,000 per unit for housing for, for homeless, uh, you know, our homeless uh, citizens here or residents, whatever you want to call them. It, it, I wasn't prepared to speak, but uh, I think that he will dig deep and find what's going on in the state. Also, I think he doesn't owe anybody anything and that he will be uh, a really good person to have in that office. And I think that he will get to the bottom of a lot of the problems that we have in the, in the controller's office in the state. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, so anybody who want, is there anyone who wants to speak about Yvonne Yu or Steve Glazer? Okay, so then in that case, uh, Patricia, I see you have your hand up. You can go for, go for it. Yes, I also want to speak for Malia Cohen. I thought Carolyn pretty much said, said, said it all. Uh, one of the things that, that, I think that some people reacted poorly to in the club were was that she was that she is an ambitious woman, and I was really um, 
quite delighted to see an ambitious woman because we're used to all the young men who are who are very ambitious, but we're not used to a lot of women who can do it all and want to do it all. I think Alpern, just like the other speakers, is wonderful. I have nothing bad to say about him, and I think, uh, you know, that's a credit to 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 the race and to all of us that that there are at least two outstanding candidates. I'm just tipping my hat to Malia. Thank you. And uh, uh, Rick, which candidate would you like to speak for? Um, so I just wanted to, for both. Um, so I just want to be very clear because I'll be abstaining in this that I have endorsed both candidates in a dual endorsement. It is, I rarely, rarely do that. Um, and it's because I have a lot of respect for both of them. And so I just wanted to be very clear on the record that when I'm abstaining, it is actually because um, I'm doing a dual endorsement and I'm trying to be true to that, um, that endorsement. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Um, so uh, Dolly, I think, we're, so we're trying to keep it even. So I don't think, it, is it, I guess we can have uh, one more speaker. Um, so if you want to go ahead, Dolly. Uh, yes, um, about Malia Cohen, um, I did not know her at all before she came to our, uh, as a guest in our, uh, our Zoom. And I was really impressed with the way that she thinks questions anew when she was asked questions about subjects that she was not conversant in. She didn't appear to be uh, troubled. Instead, she got very thoughtful and she said, thanks for the question. She really meant it. It wasn't just an appearance. And then she, um, she gave her reasoning that was going on in her mind verbally. So we could see her thought process, how she sifted the different concepts that helped her come to her decision. And when she made her decision, we knew why she made it. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it happened at least twice. And that impressed me. I thought, gee, I want someone who can think anew and be fair and, and um, evaluate. It is not um, overawed by something that she doesn't know and who led us through that. So um, I'm going to support Malia Cohen. Thank you, Dolly. Uh, so we'll take one more speaker, Keith. Uh, we try, we'll try to keep it limited. I don't wanna, in, in a future race, I don't wanna go on forever just to say that, but uh, since Keith's hand was up, let's go to Keith next. Okay, I appreciate that, John, and I'll, I'll keep, it, keep it short. Um, Again, this is reflective of what other folks uh, have said about Ms. Cohen. Um, you know, it's clear that she brings a blend in terms of uh, focus on ensuring that public dollars are working for all of us, uh, but then also uh, jointly uh, her experience uh, in being a financial steward uh, is, is particularly evident. Um, you know, whenever one is, uh, called to ensure that uh, public employee retirements uh, are being um, properly cared for uh, as she did as the president of the San Francisco employee retirement system. Um, yeah, that speaks again to her financial uh, acumen in that, in that manner. Um, she also uh, you know, comes from a, an HBCU. Uh, I don't know if folks knew that she uh, her undergrad, her graduate work was at Carnegie Mellon, but her undergraduate work was at Fisk University, uh, which is a, um, a great institution, uh, a great HBCU back in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and she's, uh, as Dolly had described, someone who uh, is a critical thinker, and uh, um, I think she's a, a good person, a uh, good person for the uh, good person for the job to, to steward uh, the state moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think we're good uh, on this race. Uh, so 
want to thank everyone for their insight and their opinions. And let's go to the next statewide position, which is for insurance commissioner. And so we had the two Democratic candidates come through, uh, Ricardo Lara and Mark Levine. And so is there anyone who'd like to speak for one or the other of those candidates? Or let's start with Ricardo Lara, our recommended candidate. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any body raising their hand. So uh, I'll, I'll go, oh, Rick. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Rick. Ricardo didn't ask me to do this, but I've known Ricardo for many years. Um, you know, he is the first um, statewide constitutional officer that's a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, has been really a champion, not only on that, but on, you know, labor issues, on healthcare, you know, was responsible for the bill that brought um, that brought undocumented people into um, the Medi-Cal um, system. Um, you know, just really an incredible leader and um, supporting Ricardo. So thank you. Thanks, Rick. Uh, is anyone who would like to speak about Mark Levine? Uh, okay, not seeing any. So um, I'll just one last call for uh, Denny. Yeah, go ahead. I think you're muted, Denny. I also would like to speak up for Ricardo Lara, who, um, well, in the legislature, authored one of the most important pieces of legislation um, for climate change, abating climate change. Um, SB 1383 was uh, first legislation, maybe the most important legislation to address short lived climate pollutants. So he's on top of a lot of stuff. He, he, he really deserves our support. Thanks, Denny. Um, okay, so let's go to the next race. Uh, uh, we see the, uh, the seen him speak already. They're one of the candidates already this evening, but we're going to discuss AD 51. Uh, so the board recommended Rick Chavez Burr. Um, the other candidate who, who's running in the race is Louis Abramson. Uh, so is there anybody who would like to speak? on this race, starting with uh, in support of Rick. Uh, Janice, you can go first. I was gonna say a word for Louis Abramson. Uh, okay, well, if you don't mind, let's have someone speaking for the recommendation first. So uh, Melissa, you can go first. Hi, um, yeah, I just wanna really quickly um, speak on behalf of Rick. Um, I've worked uh, directly with him in a professional capacity. I think Rick has a really strong progressive values. I think he'll move California in the right transformational, transformative direction, but also be really practical and get things done. Um, I've personally seen him work really hard on difficult things and sometimes unpopular things, but kept doing them because they were the right thing to do. Uh, I think it's really strong relationships that will help him be a really strong advocate in SAC. And he's really put a lot of time and energy into connecting with Santa Monica um, and this club. And I think he will really get things done for Santa Monica. So I support Rick. Thanks, Melissa. And now let's hear from Janice. So this is one of those times when when we're we're quite fortunate that whichever person is our endorsed candidate will be a really really good one, and we will be very well represented when that person wins in the in the uh, primary in the fall. I just wanted to put in a word for Louis Abramson because um, he's new to politics. He brings an incredible freshness of vision and you know no baggage from there were there were a lot of young people who came into politics a few years ago when there was a lot of very strange social media and spin and um, people getting into very extreme silos of belief and Louis got involved a bit later than that and what motivated him was just you know he's trained as an astrophysicist but his heart was really touched by the plight of his unhoused neighbors and he you know chose to take that fight to the neighborhood councils, which is usually the bastion of, of you know, just let's, let's dehumanize and demonize um, those people. So I just, I give him a lot of credit and I very much hope that, um, you know, he'll have the encouragement to keep at it because I think that one day he will find the office to run for and we'll be very, very happy to say we knew him back at the time. But again, this is one of those times when we really have, um, we're in the most fortunate position because we're gonna end up, um, in any case with, with a very good representative of someone who carries our values. Um, Appreciate uh, that, Janice. 
Um, so Denny, are you, or we want to go to Rick next, if you're just going to speak for, for Rick. Yes, for Rick. Go ahead. Well, I've worked a shoulder to shoulder with Rick for maybe 30 years. Um, and he has always been an exceptional environmental champion um, and should strongly get, get, get a strong endorsement from this club. One of the things about Rick that I really admire is that this is not his first career. He's been an organizer long before he was ever a candidate in seeking elective office. And I really admire leadership that sees themselves as organizers first and, and running for office only later. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so let's go to Judy next. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I want to speak for Rick. I've known him for years, too. I find him um, absolutely the absolutely ready to represent us in this position and to be a very effective legislator. Thank you. Let's hear from Peter. Yeah, um, I wanted, uh, wanted to, to speak a, a little bit for Louis because uh, I just I'm intrigued with the idea of a scientist actually being in the, in the legislature. I think it would be tremendously refreshing. <laughs> Frankly, I wish we could take his house, carve it out of this district, and put him in another district uh, so that he could run. Because we, everybody is right. Whoever wins this primary is going to make a great candidate for for the for the office in November and a great uh, assembly person. That's all. Thanks, Peter. And uh, I see uh, Kimball has got his hand up. So, Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think you guys have two great candidates. And just to reiterate, everybody stated that, um, you know, whoever wins this should, could be a good candidate. But I, I um, kind of know, known um, Louis since 2018, I guess. Um, canvassed with him several times um, up in the 25th now the 27th uh, congressional district um, of getting Katie Hill elected up here. And uh, he was kind of my partner on PDI, but I do, I am intrigued at several conversations with him in terms of his scientific knowledge and his knowledge of astrophysics and just being a critical thinker. But I think you guys have got two wonderful candidates um, and, you know, I, I it, 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 like I said, I hope that Lewis, if 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 um, things don't work out, that he will definitely keep coming out because he definitely is uh, going to be a great candidate for some place in the future. Great critical thinker. Thanks so much, Kimball. It's great to hear from you and to hear from everybody on this race. Um, like people have said, we have two really strong candidates. Um, okay, so now let's move on to the county level and our, our countywide race of county sheriff. Way back in February, we had our debate and the candidates uh, seeking our endorsement are Alex Villanueva, Cecil Rambo, Eli Vera, Robert Luna, and Eric Strong. And the executive board recommends Eric Strong in this race. So we're gonna start with a supporter of Eric Strong. Um, Judy, is that your the candidate you'd like to speak for? No. Okay, if you don't mind, then uh, we'll have somebody else speak first. Is uh, anybody ready to, to speak for Eric? Uh, uh, yeah, Patricia. I was hoping that Dan would speak first because he did such a good spreadsheet that really showed why um, why Eric Strong uh, was a choice for a good choice for the club. Uh, he he just he seems prepared. His answers were good. He knows his job. Um, I I oh there's Dan. So I'm going to stop talking so that Dan. Oh can... no no you should finish. Um, Dan will go second. <laughs> Anyhow, I I did think that that Eric Strong was an outstanding candidate. That's all. Great, so now let's go to Judy. 
I just want to speak for Cecil Rambo, who I've known for a very long time because I worked in the city of West Hollywood and uh, knew of him then. And I, I think that he would be a great sheriff. Certainly anyone would be better than our current sheriff, but um, he, Cecil is my choice. Thank you. And uh, let's go to Dan next. Yeah, thanks, John, and thanks, Patricia. I was trying to pull up my notes. Um, so for Eric Strong, the things that really impressed me was he was the only candidate who, during our debate, said he would support a charter amendment so that four-fifths of the Board of Supervisors could remove the sheriff and was strongly for other, over, other civilian oversight. Um, I believe his exact quote was, I have no problem with the elected officials of this county being able to remove a sheriff. Um, the other thing that really stood out to me was that he, at least by his account and um, others' admissions that they hadn't, was the only one who had led an investigation into deputy gangs uh, and was taking every or would take every step possible to remove that culture. Um, very concerned about the news uh, that broke recently about um, Sheriff Villanueva and the LAPD, or excuse me, the um, uh, the LA Times reporter. Um, and then the other thing that really stood out to me was that he was the only candidate who said he had witnessed a fellow officer use excessive force and that he had supported or reported it to a supervisor or internal affairs. So those are the things that really stood out to me about um, Eric Strong. Thanks, Dan. Let's go to Peter. You're on mute, Peter. Yeah, far be it for me to say anything good about Villanueva, but uh, uh, according to the LA Times today, uh, apparently somebody said to him, you cannot do that. So he has backed off on, at least on uh, um, uh, the Times reporter. Uh, if it is privileged information, he does have a right to find out who leaked it, uh, but you know he can't go after the reporter for, for putting it in the newspaper, and I'm glad she did. Uh, anyway, uh, he's, you know, he's uh, backed off on that. All right, uh, any other folks wanna speak up on this race? Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll uh, leave it to the voters then. Susan's hand is raised, it looks like. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Uh, Susan, go for it. Hi, um, I'd just like to say a word for Cecil Rambo. Um, I can't speak, say that I've known him for a long, long time, but I've had several conversations with him in a few different contexts, and some of the people who I trust the most, who are old timers in politics, were the first ones who um, pointed me to the direction of Cecil Rambo and pointed to his experience and you know his competence and his his values and I think that what I liked as an epidemiologist was that he spoke so strongly about um, not wanting to be anything like the current sheriff in terms of respecting public health and that goes for you know those stupid parties that the deputies were having and it goes for having vaccines necessary for people who are going to be interacting with the public like sheriff's deputies do. Um, so that impressed me. And just on a sort of personal note, I think that the young women who are working for him, um, Jubilee Byfield um, in particular, I really have respect for her family and I know her sister as well. So I just feel like he's got good taste in staff members. So maybe that's not speaking to his, his uh, ability as a sheriff, but I, 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 he's my choice. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thanks, Jubilee. Good to see you. Uh, anybody, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> anybody else want to speak on this race? Okay, great. So now we'll go to uh, the, the the last discussion for this part, which is uh, County Supervisor District 3. And we have three Democrats running, Henry Stern, Lindsay Horvath, and Bob Hertzberg. And I'll now 
take the same opportunity as I did before to mention that Bob Hertzberg uh, was not seemingly interested in coming to to speak to the club. You know, he seemed like his scheduling conflict wasn't really related to the day of the week that we were proposing. But anyway, uh, um, I'll leave it to our our candidates here. Uh, and uh, first, we want to have someone speaking on behalf of Senator Stern. So uh, I see the first one in the queue is is Abby. Uh, Abby, are you speaking for Senator Stern or a different candidate? I'll, I'll be speaking for Lindsay Horvath. Okay, so then that we'll go to you second, but we'll go to Shai first. So Shai, uh, go ahead. I think John, and, and I'm proud to um, speak on behalf of Henry. Um, Henry has been engaged with our club uh, for for years since he's been in the Senate. Prior to being in the Senate, um, he's been a leader um, uh, in the Senate on environmental issues. And not only that, he's interacted with our club. Um, he's easily accessible. Speaks at our meetings. Uh, particularly on environmental issues. He shares our club's values, uh, our, our club's progressive values. And you can see by his endorsements, uh, Ben Allen uh, has endorsed Henry, uh, League of Conservation Voters, um, you know, frontline workers, nurses, firefighters, uh, teachers with UTLA. Um, and he's the only leading candidate in the race who um, is not taking money from uh, oil and gas companies as well as from real estate developers. Um, and there's great candidates in the race. Obviously, it's a really competitive race, but Henry, Henry shares our club's values, and it will be a, a person in the in the supervisor's office that will be a great friend to the club and engaged with our club, which I think is a, is a real benefit to Santa Monica and our club members. Thanks, Jai. So now let's go to Abby Arnold. Hi, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Lindsay Horvath, and I ask you to vote for her. Um, some years ago, I was the county representative for the Service Employees International Union, and the Board of Supervisors was five men. And how glad I am now that women are finally in power running our, our county. I think it would be really sad if we were the only district with a white male county supervisor. Um, but we, I also want to say that Lindsay is such a, an excellent and qualified candidate. Her career in public service has really been dedicated to standing up for the people who need it most. She has uh, very strong relationships with the LGBTQ plus community, um, advocating on their behalf, of course, on, on women. And in the city of West Hollywood, she's created age-friendly, sustainable neighborhoods. Um, and she's endorsed by Planned Parenthood and Supervisor Sheila Kuehl. I want to remind people that this is an executive position. It's really not a legislative position. And um, Lindsay led West Hollywood as the mayor throughout the pandemic. And she's the only candidate with direct experience solving homelessness in the city of West Hollywood um, and worked very effectively with the county and with state government to get resources in and to use city resources to make a big difference for people who are unhoused in West Hollywood. She also helped enact the strongest minimum wage and worker protections in the country um, while simultaneously being named the most business friendly city in Los Angeles County during her time as mayor. And as someone who was one of the primary advocates for strong minimum wage and worker protections in Santa Monica, she kind of put us to shame by getting something stronger enacted in West Hollywood on behalf of the hotel workers and, and all the hospitality workers in that city. Um, I, uh, in my support for Lindsay, I am thinking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the importance of um, having women have our time to be making policy that directly affects people, um, all kinds of people in our county. And uh, it's time to continue the wonderful leadership of Sheila Kuehl and the rest of the supervisors and elect Lindsay Horvath. So I ask you to vote for Lindsay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Abby. And now we'll go to uh, um, Senator Stern. Thanks, John. Um, really good to be with y'all. And Thank you, Dr. Roy, for kind words. Um, I have so much respect for so many people on this call tonight. 
Um, you're all leaders in your own regard, whether you're taking heat on the school board or fighting for civil liberties with the ACLU or standing up for renters' rights or the environment or against people who are gonna develop our mountains. Um, there's a lot of brave people on this call. Um, so it's humbling to stand before you. This is a really big job. I would submit to you that um, there are things that are broken about LA County, but we're gonna need progressive solutions to fix them. We can't snap back and revert back to some conservative uh, indulgence here where we start locking people up again or criminalizing homelessness. And I'm really concerned that in this moment in LA, there's so much negative energy that things are gonna swing that way unless you've got somebody with the reach to get into the San Fernando Valley and speak Valley, which I've been doing for the last six years since being a Senator. Um, and I hope you can look past the fact that, you know, my gender or my race, uh, I, I hope those aren't your deciding factors in these races. I, I think Justice Ginsburg would want it that way too. Um, I hope you just, you look at who's going to just do the work and not shy away from the hard, the hard things. And I would just say in Santa Monica, you've made, you've made it part of your thesis as a city um, to actually confront issues, to confront affordable housing challenges head on and not just think you can only zone your way to those solutions, but actually fund them. When it comes to homelessness services and senior housing, you've stepped up and put more units out there than anybody else in this whole county. So I think we have a lot to learn from city of Santa Monica, but especially the leaders in this club. So I know we talked about environmental issues. You know, um, there's some real contrast between myself and Senator Hertzberg on that front, whether it's on offshore drilling or neighborhood drilling, um, whether it comes to development issues. And you know, I'm not taking that kind of dark money in my campaign because I just, I don't want to owe people. The only people I want to owe are, are, are you all people that I'd actually work for, people who are paying their taxes. Um, so look, we can talk about some endorsements. I know that Progressive Dems of Santa Monica Mountains is here too, and um, West LA Dems, but Palisades too. So we're honored to have all that support, but look, these races are hard. Um, these politics are tough. And, and I just hope that you look to, somebody's willing to admit mistakes when they make them. Um, I try not to approach this job with any arrogance or um, you know, know it all in this, but I really do think things are broken. There aren't enough my mobile psychiatric units uh, out on the streets right now. It can't just housing first, yes, but we need abundant services on top of that. We shouldn't talk about just compelled care. We should talk about a rights-based approach, right to treatment, the right to housing, not just how to move people off our streets. So, um, you know, it's, it's an honor to be with you. I, I hope you'll consider endorsing me. Um, we have to win this race. I think I'm the one to go beat Bob Hertzberg, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I know I've been in the Valley and in the coast for a little while here, but the roots run deep on the West side. And I promise I'm not just here for tonight. Um, I'll, I'll be with you here for the long haul. Thank you, Senator. Let's go to Judy Abdo. I want to speak for Lindsay and say that um, I've worked with her before. I think that she is the person to take the next step uh, after Sheila leaves, that she has many of the same skills and has uh, the, the ability to work within a system of a city, which is more similar to the county than being in the legislature. And um, I, I know that for sure, because I have long discussions with Sheila a lot. And I know that this is a very different kind of, of uh, position and that Lindsay is ready for it. And I, I think that I really want you all to vote for her. Um, also, I think it's really important to have somebody from the West Side um, representing our district. So that's what I have to say. Please vote for Lindsay. Thank you, Judy. And let's go to Derek. Hello, everyone. I'm Derek Devermont. I'm one of California's uh, 20 elected GNC members. And so is uh, Carolyn Fowler, who I believe is here. And I just wanted to speak in favor of supporting Henry Stern. I, I know Henry and I'll tell you, it's not easy being an advocate in any state, uh, even in California, for the environment. You become a target for special interests. 
to stand up to those special interests in favor of the environment and its people takes guts, takes bravery, takes courage. And that's why I'm supporting Henry because that's the type of person he is and I'm proud to support him and I'll be voting for him. Thanks, Derek. And let's go to Kimball next. Yeah, sure. Um, as usual, you guys have a couple of great uh, candidates with uh, Lindsay and Henry, but I haven't uh, I had a long-term conversation uh, like I've had with um, uh, Senator Stern here on issues like the environment, um, you know, water uh, conservation. And specifically, I think that I don't live in the area, but I know he'll do the job. Um, his focus on food sovereignty um, for different diverse groups in the era is incredible. And we've had long conversations about that. And I do truly believe that um, he will definitely uh, do the job uh, coming up. Um, and that's why I think that uh, he's probably a great candidate um, uh, for this position here. Thanks, Kimball. Who's your, um, by the way, Kimball, who's your uh, county supervisor out there? Uh, it is, um, you know, she doesn't do a lot for, excuse me, but uh, <laughs> um, geez, it, it is the only Republican supervisor. Catherine I'll, Barger. Catherine Barger. Yeah, thanks for letting me. <laughs> she doesn't show up a lot, but it's yeah. Catherine Barger. Yeah. That's what I thought. I just wanted to check. Thanks, Kimball. Yeah, uh, right. Kevin, uh, Kevin, go ahead. We Santa Monica Democrats have to remember that the third supervisorial district in this election is, is not the same one we're used to. The significant change in the boundaries should bring us up short and make us remember how lucky we have been to be represented by somebody from our core west side, Sheila Kuehl, who, who lives here in, in Santa Monica. Now, for the last 20 years, I've been part of something that you may not have heard of called the West Side Cities Council of Governors. And that includes Santa Monica and a group of cities moving east, going to West Hollywood. It doesn't include the San Fernando Valley. It doesn't include Malibu. It includes Santa Monica. It includes West Hollywood, Culver City, Beverly Hills, parts of the county and parts of LA City. On that body, and also now twice as mayor, Lindsay and I were our respective city's mayors at the same time, twice. I, I've worked on a number of issues with Lindsay, West Side issues. And I can tell you that she gets Santa Monica in a way that somebody who's not from the West Side would have a very hard time doing. And she gets our issues. And you know, West Hollywood is a rent control city. I mean, formed basically on rent control. That should be important to us. I know that the environment is important in this election, and I certainly was a sustainability and environmental activist the whole time I was in office. Uh, something that you need to know about Lindsay is that besides working with me on the West Side Cities Council of Governments, she was instrumental in the founding of the Clean Power Alliance. Now, the day that we in Santa Monica went to 100% renewable electricity through the Clean Power Alliance, uh, we dropped our environmental footprint on energy by, by 17%. And Lindsay is not just somebody involved with, with that. She is a committee head. She's the head of the legislative committee. I was the head of the energy committee. So I can wholeheartedly tell you, Lindsay is somebody who gets Santa Monica, who shares our values, and who can excel in all the areas that other candidates asking for our votes might also be able to, but can do it from a West Side point of view. And I think if we let this district get away from us and not be a West Side district anymore, it's a loss we'll never get to reverse. So let's keep it West Side and let's keep it with Lindsay Horvath. Thank you, Kevin. And I see uh, Patricia has got her hand up. Just briefly on the West Side issue, Henry, Henry went through school in the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. And while he actually lived in the Malibu portion, he knew Santa Monica, he knows Santa Monica, and he also is huge on affordable housing and Lindsay wanted to 
you know, believes in building that all housing is equal. She doesn't, she doesn't support affordable housing over market rate housing. Thanks, Patricia. And um, now we're gonna go to Dorothy. And then I think that'll be the last speaker. I, I just wanna make a personal plea for those of us who live in the wildfire areas that for us electing Henry might indeed be a matter of life and death because Henry understands the situation up in the mountains. He understands the interplay between the LA city fire department, the LA county fire department. He understands our 69 Bravo helicopter pad up in Topanga that's going to save Malibu and Topanga if there's another big fire. He understands the fires in the valley. He was there for the, um, the fires that burn um, the near in uh, the Ensure County areas uh, and Malibu. So we really, really need to elect him. And if a fire goes from Topanga into the Palisades, the people in the Palisades are also very worried that someone will be elected who does not understand the problems that we have here. And Henry understands our problems as well as the problems in the city, the problems in the valley. He's been all over and he grew up in Los Angeles. Not many of us did. And he knows everything about this city and he's going to bring a fresh perspective to, to all forms of government here and how we, we run things because things are broken in the city when we, we need someone young and, and energetic and ready to, to hit the ground running and tackle these problems. So I totally urge you to vote for Henry to make sure he gets the 60% so that you can add your name to the list of clubs who have endorsed Henry. Thanks, Dorothy. And with respect to uh, Keith and Danny, I think since I mentioned we were going to cut it off before your hands went up, I think we'll, we'll cut it off here. So um, with that said, uh, I think we've gotten through the candidates. So I just wanted to remind everyone before we open up the polls of our Recommendations, Malia Cohen for controller, Ricardo Lara for insurance commissioner, Rick Chavez Burr for assembly, Eric Strong for sheriff, Henry Stern for county supervisor, and for LA Superior Court judge, the following candidates, Tim Rubin, Anna Raitano, Elizabeth Lashley Haynes, Holly Hancock, Lloyd Handler, Georgia Huerta, Patrick Hare, Carol Ellswick. Okay, so in a few minutes, basically, as soon as I'm done talking and I hand it over to Melissa, I'm going to set up the uh, mail, the, the election uh, ballots are going to go out in your inbox. You'll receive an email. It should say that it's from Santa Monica Democratic Club. It might say election buddy, but it should say the name of the club. The subject line is going to say vote now, Santa Monica Democratic Club primary endorsements. And you'll receive up to three emails if you live in Santa Monica or if you live in all the relevant districts, you'll get three emails. Most of the races will be on the main ballot number one that has all of the statewide and county races. Ballot number two will be for county supervisor. And ballot number three will be for assembly. And uh, also wanted to make sure that everyone knows that in addition to all the candidates, you also have the option to choose no endorsement or abstain. So just to clarify what those mean, um, no endorsement means that you believe none of the candidates on the ballot should get the club's endorsement. None of the candidates on the ballot should get the club's endorsement. If you feel that way, when you're looking at the race, you should vote for no endorsement. If you vote for abstain, that means that you don't think you have enough information to make a decision or for whatever reason, you want to let the other members decide. So your decision not to vote will not affect the totals. It won't count against anybody. You're just saying, I don't, I don't wanna participate in that race for any reason. That's abstain. Okay, so now we're gonna turn it over to our programs VP, Melissa Goodman. And I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that as the voting begins, if you have any issues receiving your ballot or any problems along the way, uh, you can send me a DM on Zoom. Mike Soloff, our membership VP, is also going to be 
uh, you know, looking under the hood to help us get this processed and everything okay. So any issues, just send me or Mike a message and we'll get it sorted out. I'm gonna set the ballots to go out in a few minutes and they'll go until 10, uh, let's say uh, 10, 10. So there'll be a, a half hour to vote. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Melissa. I'm gonna go get the ballots out. Great, thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, Senator Island, Ben, are you here? Still, still awake? You've been very patient. Yes, 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 here I am, okay. <laughs> You've been really great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hello. Yeah. This is the late hour. Everyone's had a, doesn't have as much energy. Everyone's looking through email. I'm going to dispense with any lengthy introductions. Most, if not everyone here, knows you quite well. So, hi, welcome. We're happy to have you. Um, we might get interrupted, as John just said, with people shouting questions about the voting. So, you're good with that, I'm sure. So, I was gonna. I was hoping. Oh, and we're still letting people in while we spend this time voting. Um, I was hoping that you could, can you still hear us? I just wanna make sure, cause you went off camera. Yes, yes, I can. Um, I was hoping you could just kick us off, you know, first sharing about, I'll, I have a bunch of questions for you, you know, at the end, but could you just share for a few minutes, you know, five, 10 minutes, whatever strikes your fancy uh, about anything you'd like the membership to know about your work uh, this session, whether it's bills, budget, advocacy, you know, you're pushing or just generally things going on in Sacramento that you think our membership should know about. Share with us, we'd love to Yes, know. well, thank you. Thanks, Melissa. It's so great to, to see everybody again. Um, I, I you know, obviously love being a, on the board of this club for, for a long time, and, and it's great to see so many friends on the, on the Zoom. Um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously really looking forward to back to the time when we can all be back in person again, though the flip side is, uh, you know, I'm able to, you know, hear everybody participate in the meeting while I'm cleaning up the kitchen here in Sacramento. Um, uh, you know, because we have session tomorrow. So anyway, it's a very, very busy, very busy time in Sacramento right now. Uh, we've been, uh, we've had all these major bill deadlines that have been coming up this week. So Henry, Henry knows well, we, we were hanging out today a little bit earlier. Um, you know, a couple things to just talk about. Uh, the budget has, of course, been a, a really uh, major topic uh, that we've been discussing recently. We've got major surplus. And, um, uh, you know, we, we approved a, a historic budget last year that allocated you know, massive increases in funding for homelessness programs, early education, pandemic relief programs, all while keeping a, a very healthy rainy day reserve. All of that is going to only grow. And we've been talking about a, a real investment oriented budget. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure uh, to, uh, you know, to try to, you know, create all these uh, tax cuts and, and, and rebates. And I, I do certainly agree that there is a certain portion of our population that has really been suffering that, that needs to, uh, that, that should be given additional relief given the, 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 you know, the, the budget surplus. But I also think that there's so much, there's so much backlog in terms of investment that we've just uh, underinvested in over the years. And I say this as a former school board member, uh, you know, I, I know the, the M&O uh, costs over at the, at the RK through 12 system, at the UC system, and community colleges, Cal State, our transportation system, uh, homelessness programs, uh, you know, the list, the list goes on and on. So I, I you know, and certainly, you know, climate uh, resiliency projects, but also you know, continuing to invest in those projects that are going to help us uh, be a, a global leader in fighting climate change. I, I just think that needs to be where we, where we put so much of our focus. Um, I, I saw uh, Janice's little comment about the GAN limit uh, pop up on my phone. Uh, the one thing to mention, and I can go into it more in more detail, but the GAN limit does allow us, we are allowed to invest in certain types of infrastructure. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and so that's that w without triggering the GAN limit. There are some complicated rules, but, but infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure and most types of infrastructure investments uh, uh, give us some flexibility with the GAN limit. That being said, we are looking to put a ballot measure on the ballot in 2024 that would change the GAN limit rules a bit, so as to um, uh, so as to uh, 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 give us some more flexibility in the future. Um, and so, stay tuned on that as well. Um, anyway, I, I've been I've been working really closely with Henry on 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 a whole slew of of important environmental issues. He's the chair of the Natural Resources Committee. I'm at Environmental Quality. 
Uh, we've been working on, on really trying to, we're both serving on this climate working group that we've come, we brought together with a couple of their members of the legislature, uh, working on, on trying to keep California at the forefront of the fight against climate change. Uh, we've been working on trying to create more aggressive uh, short-term, um, you know, medium-term uh, deadlines for meeting our, the climate goals that, that will move us toward the, the SB 32 goals that, that Fran Pavley helped to codify in, into law. Uh, and right now, a lot of it has to do with really trying to build out the infrastructure, improving our charging systems, uh, trying to, to speed up the, the move toward electrification in general, and alternative fuels and, and clean energy uh, sources writ large. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got a bill, for example, I mean, this is just a small example, but I, I got a bill that just um, went out of the, uh, of the of the housing committee that that calls for new housing construction, multifamily units to at least the garages ought to be wired for electricity. They don't have to have charging stations, but they should at least have wire uh, electricity access. If we really want you know, most people to be driving electric cars in, in 20 years, it's crazy to be building more and more multifamily units without even electricity capacity down in the garage, which is something that I think that most people uh, in, in, in communities like ours kind of take for granted. Uh, but, but unfortunately it's not a reality for so many of our fellow Californians. Um, I continue to be, uh, uh, you know, work a lot on transit issues. I got a big bill that's going to help to speed up our, our, our transit projects in, in the, in the buildup to the 2028 Olympics. Um, I got another bill through SB 433 that's now going to give the Coastal Commission a clear authority to issue administrative penalties for unpermitted damage to wetlands, natural habitats, and coastal waters. It's going to be the first uh, opportunity for the state to finally hold oil companies accountable who have oil spills that take place in federal waters. Uh, but the damage comes and hits our coast, our, our state waters uh, in our own state. Um, so I'm proud of that one. Uh, we did it. Our, I'm working a lot on plastics issues, folks may know. I got a bill through last year that is a truth in environmental advertising saying that if your item is not truly recyclable, you shouldn't be able to put the chasing arrow symbol, the recycling symbol on your plastic product. Um, you know, writ large, of course, we're, you know, we're spending a ton of money on, on, on this plastics uh, uh, pollution problem. It's becoming a real problem for local governments. Just to give you an idea, the city of Los Angeles used to make about $5 million a year on, uh, on selling uh, recycling, recycled products, uh, recycling products. And now it's, it's losing a million dollars a year just to, just to meet its diversion rates and its requirements. Uh, so so we, we're working, I'm in the middle of a very intense negotiation over uh, with, with industry and the environmental community for our SB 54, which would, would require producers to reduce at the source the amount of throwaway packaging and food service wear as much as possible. Uh, we have so much over packaging. The, the second pillar would require whatever is left on the market to be truly recyclable or compostable. I mean, really recyclable under real market conditions and not you know, just theoretically. Uh, and then the third pillar is, is shifting the burdens of managing packaging material to the producers instead of our city and county governments and, and individual consumers. Who, who, it's the producers who ultimately have the tools at their disposal to really determine whether a product is going to be is going to be reusable, recyclable, compostable in the, in the future, and and the type of, of plastic resins they may use can make a huge difference in the circularity of their product. Uh, anyway, th that we're, we're working. Anyway, do you try to jump in, Melissa? Oh no, it's okay. I, okay, I was gonna, only if you were wrapping, I was going to jump in. But if you if you wanted to share anything else, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm continuing to work really hard on, on a lot of, um, of, of campaign disclosure issues. I, 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 as you all know, I'm a really close partner with the California Clean Money Campaign and Common Cause and, and those guys. Um, we've got our Disclosure Clarity Act that I'm doing with Senator, Her uh, Senator Umberg, which is the first in a law in the nation requiring online political ads to clearly and prominently show their top funder on the ad itself. So foiling certain tactics that are used by some campaign committees to avoid the current transparency requirements. Uh, and then, and then I've got another one, one final bill, and then I'll stop just to, just to, just because these are so fun to talk about. I've got a bill that I'm working on with uh, Consumer Watchdog and CalPerg uh, to on, on, on oil prices. Uh, folks may remember that when we had that big explosion. So we all know we have higher oil prices in California. It's true. I mean, I'll go to another state, you'll you'll know this. Um, and and it is true that some of it has to do with our gas tax. Some of it has to do with our environmental rules because we have a special cleaner blend for our, 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 our oil, which of course, you know, we, we, we require in the state of California because of how bad our air quality has been in the past. And the fact that kids were growing up in LA with half of the lung capacity of kids in other parts of the country because of our, our smog. So we know that, but, but there is still a mystery gas surcharge. There's even when you account for those factors, 
there's still uh, something about 50 cents a gallon that is an additional cost that we are that that our that our um, our, our ratepayers are paying, our, our our drivers are paying in the state of California. And so we're working on a bill to cast some some light on that to require disclosure. Uh, so that the, that the refiners would have to publicly disclose the average monthly price that they pay for crude oil and the profit margins that they're making on the gasoline that they refine and sell. And so the idea is that by combining this information with other publicly available pricing data, we'll just get a much clearer picture behind you know, what the mystery gas surcharge that's costing Californians um, you know, millions at the gas pump every year. So uh, you know, that's that it's, it's another thing I'm working on that, that just got out of energy committee. Uh, and I was, I was proud to get that out of the committee just a couple of days ago because it's the committee is um, has a lot of um, pro industry people or at least people who are more yeah, sympathetic. Hard to get them but out. <laughs> yeah, but they saw they saw the value of what we were trying to do and how important it was for um, for, for for regular folks. That's great. Well, thank you. And that does sound fun in like the right policy nerd kind of way, you know, so you're in the right crowd for it to be fun. Um, I'm going to get it more into some policy stuff and a little bit, a few questions about uh, your bills and, and some other bills in a second, but I, I wanted to, to zoom out just two quick questions about sort of your vision for the future and your, your third term, which, you know, right now it's looking pretty certain because, you know, you're in an uncontested race. So let's assume you're going to be with us <laughs> a little bit more. I uh, one question is, um, are there any issues that you feel like you're going to be putting more energy into in your third term, you know, than you did in, in prior years? Will that look different at all? Can we, you know, do, should we expect the same kind of focus? Anything that looks different? By the way, I do actually, I do have a Republican opponent. Um, mm. she's, a, she's running as a write-in, but the funny uh, thing- Okay, I, might, I missed that in the-, in the This is what's so interesting. Assuming- yeah. Um, you, the crazy thing about our system, it's a top two system. So as long as she qualifies for the write in and she votes for herself, she'll be the second place vote getter. So right. we'll be on the runoff. We'll run against each other in November. She Thank you for like, that correction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, she seems like a very nice person who watches way too much Fox News. Um, and, and, you know, she's just kind of like adopted all the crazy Republican conspiracy theories. But, um, you know, anyway, I, I think it's it's not a good it's not a bad thing to have a race and to get out there and ask people for your vote and have debates. And I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, assuming everything goes well, touch, touch wood. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think ultimately um, I've, I've kind of found my groove a bit. I, I, I'm really passionate about environmental policy and protection. I'm passionate about transparency and clean money and, um, you know, and, and all those kinds of uh, political reform issues. I mean, the more time I spend in Sacramento, the more I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, um, uh, I, I guess both dispirited, but also motivated by the just incredible power of special interest money in determining outcomes that that oftentimes put regular folks behind. And I just think it's one of the reasons why I, I think we need to continue to really look at at, at political reform as, as a focus. I'm getting more interested in the energy space. Um, it's obviously been a, an area that, that you know, Henry's been really Henry Stern's been really interested in for a long time. I mean, the more we talk about it, and, and, and you know, I've, I've I've and the more uh, the deeper I get on environmental issues and climate issues, I realize how important energy is. It really is at the heart of our battle against climate change. And so um, I'm certainly considering trying to get myself onto the energy committee and getting deeper into some of those battles. I mean, I see Kevin here. You know, we've done some work together, uh, you know, defending CCAs, and uh, there's a lot of complicated issues that are going to continue to evolve. Um, you know, uh, so that that may be a space that I want to spend some more time on. Um, yeah. So do you think you have any I don't maybe because you talked about your own kind of learning about just seeing the power of interest. But do you have any kind of this sounds negative, a mistake or regret a learning, you know, from the, the last two terms that you think, you know, will cause you to act differently um, or make you more effective in your third term? I don't know. But you know, will the effect of time limit or term limits, you know, have have any effect in, in how you expect to act? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's a great question. I, I do think that when you first start, you th there's a tendency to, um, uh, to, to you, you don't know, you, 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 you want to fit into the, to the culture. Um, you, you, you don't want to do something that seems too crazy. And yet, I, I, now that I've been there for a little, and then of course, I, the funny thing is I did do a couple of wild things. Um, <laughs> That I probably, you know, that I'm glad I did, but I, I'm not sure I would do again. But um, that being said, I think I, I know the system better now, and I know where um, where I can push more. And um, I do. There, there are times where I, I do regret a little bit going with the flow on certain issues. Where I think I, if I'd been a little bit more, if I'd pushed back more, mm -hmm. I, I I think I could have um, 
uh, steered things in a better direction. Uh, and, and so I, I guess I'm, I, now that I've got a deeper spidey sense, I, I'm going to be more proactive in, in helping to steer things that I think might be, uh, might, might need, th 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 that might be a, a little uh, 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 off kilter or, or may not be in the best interest of my community. Well, that's great. Is that in any particular topical area or that's just sort of a learning across the board? Um, it's across the board. I mean, there's all sorts of little things that I, that I, um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you know, we're, we're right now we're, I mean, for example, I, I, I think that, uh, uh, there, there's some, there's some things on, on our election system, uh, there, there's some shibboleths that are, that that are that are out there among some members and, and certainly among a, a lot of the uh, 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 um, within our party that I that I think you know I think you know when you, when you look at at at, um, at at some of the redistricting issues for example I think I think we need to be looking um, a little more critically at some of the policies that are just being rubber stamped. Uh, I, so I, I want to relook at. I mean, for example, I thought I thought that the that the the, the count, we were talking about the county lines, right? I mean, I think the county redistricting system did not go very well, right? The fact that the redistricting commission was asking for basic, they were asking basic questions about the Voting Rights Act and the California Voting Rights Act, like three weeks before they were supposed to come up with their final um, set of maps. Um, I I just think we need to sometimes the legislature. Uh, gets the work works with 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 advocacy groups that, that that don't think through all the issues. They oftentimes have a really good goal, but they're not quite as thoughtful about the details. And we need to um, we, we we always need to think about details and implementation when we're when we're passing these policies that we push down on everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to go in a different direction. Thank you for that reflection, though. Um, I mean, let's touch on uh, that. Hey, uh, Melissa, if you don't mind yeah. interrupting really quick, I just wanted to put out another notice that we have 15 minutes until the ballot closes. So everyone make sure you vote, including Melissa and Ben. Yeah, we do have to vote. <laughs> right. We'll and uh, if anyone didn't get their ballot for some reason, as far as I know, it all is sorted out now. So if anyone still hasn't gotten it, definitely let me know now. Okay. I don't by the way, I, I don't seem to have gotten mine, so I, I don't know. If, uh, All right, I'll I'll work on it. Thanks, Ben. And I won't be offended if you if you multitask during our conversation. Right. <laughs> if you don't mind, I I might do it. Yeah, all good. Yeah. Great. Um, I was going to go in a different direction and just touch on a couple, just a couple, um, you know, policy areas that are important to the club's membership. One um, in particular, I wanted to talk about, I mean, in a very general way, want to hear a little bit about, you know, top of mind for everyone. What's your strategy for addressing, you know, the problem of houselessness and the yeah. short affordable housing in our district? I want to hear about that generally, but I have a very specific question about that. It relates to, a, you know, discussion and debate that um, was happening actually in our, in our legislative committee, our, our club um, is discussing um, very vociferously, and there is not a meeting of the minds yet, um, but hasn't yet decided whether to take a position on, an, on AB 2053, uh, which is obviously a bill that you are co-authoring. Um, and yeah. so we would love to hear generally sort of your your, your vision on, on how to deal with with the affordability problem, obviously, um, but why you are co-authoring that bill and, and why you see that as, as the right approach. I will be honest that there was a lot of a mix of opinions about whether that is the right approach in the discussion. So we would really like to learn from you about that. Look, I, I think that, um, th listen, none of these bills are a, a panacea, right? I mean, there's there, the, in the end of the day, this addressing um, the the housing affordability challenges that we have and 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 our and and, and, a, and the unacceptable level of number of folks who are on our streets uh, without homes is going to take so many different uh, uh, so so many different um, uh, uh, you know policy paths. I, I guess what I what I like about this, you know, first of all, I spent a lot of time in in Europe. Um, social housing is something that I've come to believe in as a as a as a model. These are homes that are built with good jobs. They're sustainable. They're collectively owned. Uh, they're affordable for all income levels. They're financially self-sustaining. Um, housing for people with higher income subsidize low income units and they allow housing developments to become self-sustaining and revenue neutral. Uh, and then of course the remaining funds are used for community development and repairs. And it's a, it's a mixed income model that's been successfully used in, in um, I know up, up here in Sacramento actually there's the, the CATA program that's, that has been pretty successful. Um, 
you know, the, the truth is that um, we, we just don't have enough for affordable housing. And this is, this is another, from my perspective, this is another tool in the tool toolkit. Uh, I, 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 I don't mean to claim that this bill is gonna solve all of our problems. And I know that there are some other models out there that some folks prefer, but I do think that this is, a, this is one model that I think we ought, to, we, ought to, we ought to spend some time developing and scaling. Makes sense, thank you. Um, technically, I'm not supposed to take Q and A, but John, your hand is raised, so I, I thought I would at least say hi and see if you had something you wanted to ask or share. Well, I heard Ben Allen was speaking, and so I just pers I personally wanted to come on and thank Ben Allen. Today, he fought for gender neutral bathrooms at the Senate Housing Committee, which passed unanimously through a bipartisan vote of the legislature up there to um, allow cities to opt in to um, do gender neutral bathrooms. And I personally wanted to thank him. I know I texted you earlier, Senator, but um, on behalf of the city and so many others in our community, uh, thank you for standing with um, our community and, and passing that hap it, It's great to know that we can count on you up there. And I just wanted to jump in after a four hour neighborhood watch meeting that I just got back from uh, to say to say thank you personally. Well, John, I just point of personal privilege. I just want to I want to thank you, John. I want to thank the city of, of West Hollywood, the city of Santa Monica for, for also co-sponsoring the bill. But I really I got goosebumps uh, just now when you when you brought this up again. The fact that we had this bill um, that is going to allow West Hollywood to to you know to to do what's such an important thing for 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 so many of its residents, especially the trans community that's been so vilified and and uh, and attacked of late. And to have the Republican members of our housing committee vote for this bill was was just such a, 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 a it, it really was a heartwarming thing. I mean, in this moment of 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 extreme partisanship, uh, uh, demonization of the trans community on the right. Um, it's just it was it was a wonderful moment of humanity uh, to have them recognize the value of a bill like this, and I, I just I, I just I, I continue to feel um, grateful for the relationships that that I've been able to build there um, that I think helped to make that possible, and, and then just the, the steadfast uh, support and work with with the city of West Hollywood. It was a really great experience, John, and and um, you know there's a lot more work to do on this bill, but. Um, Thank you. Thanks for thanks for bringing it to me, and and um, you know, and, and I know you're going to be there every step of the way with me on this, and I appreciate and, it. And 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 maybe it's a great bill for the Santa Monica Democratic Club to come on and and support John. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, we can talk about it in our legislative committee. <laughs> great, and I I hear the ACLU supported it. I kind of know who they are. So thank you, Senator. Um, thanks, and, and go Rick Zabur and Lindsey Horvath. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> Um, folks, please bear with me. I, I let John, I didn't know what John wanted to say. Um, I just have two more quick questions and I do think we will have um, time for, for Peter and um, anybody else who has uh, questions or their hands up. So I'm just gonna ask um, two more quick ones and then I'll, then I'll, I'll open it. Um, one other topic that, as you know, this club is very interested in, uh, so I'd be remiss if I didn't at least touch on it, is obviously single payer uh, healthcare, obviously. Yeah. Didn't happen this year. What do you think it's going to take to make it a reality? Soon or soon well, or long from yeah, now? It's a tough question because I think I think there was a lot of issues uh, that that came up, but one of the ones that I think really spooked a lot of people was the fact that in the end of the day, the um, the whole system, the whole the whole single payer kind of single payer happens in our state in our state um, with massive waivers. We, we basically have to incorporate all of the incoming money that funds Medi-Cal and Medicare. Um, and that would be a really important part of the financing mechanism for a single payer system. And so that was kind of off the table during the Trump administration because there was no way that they were gonna give us these waivers. And of course, when Biden got elected, it, there was a lot of renewed interest. The problem is those waivers could be revoked anytime. And I think the fear is that if we, we, you know, we put in, I think one of the fear that one of the interesting, there's so many, I mean, obviously there were a lot of people who don't want single payer for all the old reasons, but I do, I just don't want to, I wanted to bring this up to folks to consider, because I think we're amongst, you know, uh, fellow travelers here. But one of the issues that, that, that I think really has a lot of people in the legislature spooked 
is the idea that we could go through this massive change, switch over to single payer based on these federal waivers, and then Donald Trump or any similar type of Republican gets elected, rescinds them and throws our entire system into chaos. And so um, anyway, I, I wanna throw that out there for people to think about. And if someone's got a good idea as to how to get around it, um, please let, let us know. Got it. Um, I actually just, I, thanks for the patience with the hands. I just do wanna talk uh, quickly about just two other bills that the, the club is um, supporting and working on. One is uh, one that you are co-authoring, uh, which is AB 2050. I just, um, which you know relates to sort of stopping speculator evictions. I just wondered if you would talk um, because not everybody knows about that bill. Um, if you just say a few words about why why you're working on that and why you think it's important. Yeah, this is Ellis Act reform. I mean, it's obviously it's a bread and butter issue for for so many of my fellow Santa Monican, uh, you know, Santa Monicans at the club and in, in Santa Monica for renters' rights. I mean, this so this bill basically prohibits the withdrawal of um, property from the rental market under the Ellis Act in a rent controlled jurisdiction unless every owner has owned the property for at least five continuous years. And um, so, uh, you know. I mean, we all know that we've got, as we say, a, a massive homelessness problem. And, and we certainly have seen, th there's a lot of reasons for it. One of them has to do with those people who are really at the edge. Um, you know, we, we've seen speculators taking advantage of Alice to withdraw rental units because they intend to go out of the rental housing business, supposedly. Um, and of course, so many of these properties provide affordable rent control housing for low-income tenants. And so, uh, you know, these speculators who you know, sometimes have owned the property for just a very short period of time are using the Ellis Act to, to rid themselves of these financially unproductive tenants, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, in some cities where rent protections are less firm than in ours, uh, some have you know, just straight up used it to replace low-income tenants with market rate tenants. So we're trying to get at this issue. It's, it's, it's proven to be a really tough one, I, you know, uh, like single payer, right? I mean, it just, you know, progressives come up, we come up with these bills and then we kind of run into brick walls. Um, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm, we're just gonna keep trying. We're gonna try different angles. Um, but, it, it, you know, I think it's a righteous cause and I'm, 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 I think it's an important part of, of helping to address uh, the homelessness challenges that we we're talking about earlier. Excellent. Um, and my last one before I go to Peter and Janice um, that we just wanted to touch on with you is uh, SB 1173. Uh, we're supporting the bill that would require California's public employee pension funds to divest um, a huge amount of money from the largest publicly traded uh, fossil fuel firms. Um, if it gets through appropriations, it's coming your way. And we're just um, curious where you stand on that. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I so I did a bill a few years ago that was a precursor to this bill, which basically said that, you know, climate risks are are material financial risks, and 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 basically asked the asked the funds to 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 be required the funds to report on their analysis of the risk and, and their engagement activities associated with publicly traded companies that are uh, the most carbon intense, like utilities and gas and oil producers. Um, uh, so this bill, uh, uh, yeah, it basically you know prohibits CalPERS and CalSTRS from making any additional or new investments or renewing existing investments of public employee retirement funds in fossil fuels. Um, and it requires them to liquidate investments. Now there is a, like a fiduciary, there's some, there's some kind of out language, um, which, you know, they basically had to get, they had to accept to, uh, to, you know, because of some of the labor concerns. Um, but I think it, I think it's an important, uh, you know, with it, it basically is a, uh, an important, um, uh, kind of stand for us to take. I don't know if folks have had the opportunity to watch the Frontline has been doing this fascinating uh, series on big oil. And, um, uh, and, you know, and I, I, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, it's shocking and, and depressing and reminds you of Al Gore losing in 2000, which I think, you know, was, was the beginning of the end. But, um, you know, the, the, I, I really do think that, 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 that I, I hope the bill passes. I'm certainly you know, planning on voting for it. I saw it get out of committee just last week. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, it's a really important uh, stand for California to take, given the severity of the climate crisis and, and the, the importance of us uh, uh, taking a stand, uh, you know, uh, both for clean energy alternatives, but also against those that are profiteering off of our children's futures. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Well, minute. I have like 10 more questions for you <laughs> if we had the time, but um, I just want to flag up uh, oh. to make sure Senator Allen gets a chance to vote before oh, we this is the, true. Uh, the deadline here. Time here. to vote, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> should we should we like take a pause? John, you want to sing? Here we go. Yeah, they came in. Okay, <laughs> cool. Do you want to um, do you want to take a minute? I can, you know, I can, I can, we can, we can wrap and, and keep talking. What do you want us to do, John? Go ahead. Let's, let's pose another one to him. He's, he's voting. Okay, he's multitasking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm okay uh, hearing from Peter and then Janice. Yeah, Peter and Janice. Let's do that. Peter, go ahead. Hey, Ben. How are hey, you doing? Hey, Peter. Uh, I love, I love the, I love the, the little uh, peephole. That's good. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I, I haven't figured out. How, I've got a local picture that I want to put in there, and I haven't figured out how to do it yet. But anyway, uh, early on, you mentioned uh, uh, political reform, and I assume you you're talking about basically public financing of of uh, of races, which is something that that is very important to me, and. Uh, I know because of thinking about it and looking at things, it's not an easy subject, but what is being done? What are people talking about? I mean, getting all of this money like the fossil fuel people out of politics. Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> I mean, look, unfortunately our campaign finance um, law doesn't allow, you know, it, is, is, it, it may, may, you know, certainly limits the amount to which we can prevent um, you know, businesses, corporations, individuals from participating in the political process. And I think in the end of the day, part of, one of the many things we have to do is, is build up uh, jurisprudence that's gonna lead to an, uh, to an eventual overturn of, of, uh, of the, the Citizens United decision. Um, so, so that's certainly, that has to be a part of the story. Um, but you know, I think we need to do more disclosure, more transparency, um, you know, I, I was just today, in fact, I got a bill out of committee that's going to going to increase the the campaign um, disclosure rules so that we can get more timely information about who's giving to candidates, um, you know, outside of the the, the final, uh, uh, you know, right now there's there's very quick disclosure for the for contributions that are made at the end of campaigns, but very, very slow disclosure for everything else. And I want to I want to create uh, a, a much more robust disclosure system. I think similarly, it's why I've been so involved with the Disclose Act and all the work that the California Clean Money Campaign has inv been involved with to try to disclose the money behind everything from signature gathering campaigns, um, TV ads, uh, all the rest. So at the very least, I mean, it, you know, if we, if we can't overturn Citizens United tomorrow, at the very least, we can get more information out to voters so that they can they can better understand who it is that's 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 fighting for these causes and, and pushing for these candidates and trying to push their agenda. Um, you know, in so many places, and in fact, in California, before we passed these laws, these ads would just get thrown up onto TV or sent into your mailbox, and you had so little information as to who was spending all this money. So that's a big part of the story. I mean, certainly, I, I do. I certainly support public financing. It's been struggle to get those public financing passed uh, statewide, but I, I, you know, I've been, I've been working on bills to try and make it easier for local governments to do it or local entities to do it if they want to at the local level. We've run into some legal trouble, and I think ultimately we're going to have to do another ballot measure, and that's proven to be difficult. Um, voters are weird on this issue. They just kind of feel like they don't want their money to go to politicians, but they, I think, fail to recognize that um, the current system is, is actually more corrupting and more um, uh, detrimental to the, the broader public interest. Uh, so for, for, for my perspective, I, I really, I mean, if you're interested in this space, I just can't commend enough the work of um, Common Cause and the California Clean Money Campaign and League of Women Voters. And I just encourage people to join those organizations, um, you know, get involved, like, like get their, you know, California Clean Money Campaign has a great system for advocacy and alerts. Um, they they can galvanize uh, uh, people to call in and, 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 and activate all up and down the state to get good transparency bills passed. They're a great organization and they really deserve people's contributions and, and time. Thanks, Benny. John, do I have time to take at least one more question? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, let's do it. Patient. Hi. 
So Ben, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah. I know that that uh, working on on clean money and better disclosure has been like I think from the moment you got to Sacramento, I think that might have been the first thing that you did. So thank you for all of that. Um, the uh, I think that the there's a lot of really exciting housing bills happening. I don't know. Yeah. If legislature has ever been this active and moving as much. Um, and thank you for, for how involved you've been on them. Uh, the social housing build, I do think, is the transformative moment that we've been waiting for. And um, because it was going to its first committee hearing last week, um, I kind of asked the, uh, the Dem Club now has an actual legislative committee that meets and deliberates and has a process. And I asked them to consider it because I thought it, that if the exec board could do a letter in time for that first committee hearing. To my shock uh, and, um, and almost disbelief, the committee uh, decided they needed more study and weren't ready to just jump on it. I just I thought it was like completely up the alley of our club. So I know it has a long road ahead. Can you give us an idea of how long, you know, when the next big inflection points are and if the club, you know, is going to consider it, you know, when should we be feel that we're up to speed on it. And maybe maybe since you're now a co-author of it, maybe you would maybe we can have you talk to the club at some point where that's yeah. And I'm also, I think you guys would also, I'm sure you'd enjoy, I, I, Alex Lee's spoken to the club before, right? John, I think so. He has. Yeah. yeah. And he's a great guy. And, and I'm sure he'd also be able to, to really get into the ins and outs with you. Um, I mean, look, it's, 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 it got out of, uh, it got out of committee. Um, of course, now it's going to go over to assembly appropriations. And I just have no idea what's going to happen there. I mean, I think, you know, bills like this um, either, you know, uh, Assembly Member Holden is now the, the 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 appropriations chair, and I just don't know where he is on an issue like this. Um, uh, you know, I I I and it's going to you know, and of course, some of this is going to be influenced by where the governor is, and I, you know, I I just I'm I'm hopeful that they will uh, that that there will be a good. In fact, now that you're asking me these questions, I'm going to call Alex and talk to him about it. Like, what's his strategy for trying to get this out of appropriations? It's the kind of thing where I can see. A, a targeted and, and, and smart advocacy campaign with the leadership and with Holden uh, being successful and getting him to you know, give this a, 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 a you know a, a stamp of approval. I can also see some of the nervousness about a new model taking over and having the bill die there. I, I really could see either path, and so um, <sighs> it's a really big deal that the building trades got on it. Yeah, that's true. Right. Well, it's all union built. Um, so, so once, you know, I mean, their, their general MO has been, you know, as long as you adopt their language, they'll, they'll get, they'll get behind your bill. So um, uh, now the interesting thing is the assembly leadership has been in a bit of a, um, of a bit of a battle with the building trades. Um, I know they, they pick and choose their battles with the building trades. And so I, I, I just, I hope that this wouldn't be the one, one of the bills that they would take out their anger at them. Um, so I'm listen, Janice. I'm gonna call Alex. Actually, I, I see him from time to time anyway. I'm I'm gonna give him a ring and just kind of talk to him about the strategy and just kind of give it up, get an update. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but Alex, I talked to him today. Pressure. It's a really good moment to call call the appropriations chair. Call Chris Holden. That's it. He's got a shot. Yeah. He said he's he thinks he. I think we can get it over here. I'm just okay. We had a very good conversation, but we need like make those phone calls. Ben, when you're in Santa Monica, we'll, we'll go for coffee and I'll show you my pictures of Karl Markshoff and all the places, all the social housing that <laughs> yeah. eight years ago, Kevin or more, that we were in Vienna. And that was a lot of our pilgrimage spots. Well, and actually, and Amsterdam and, and Helsinki. Yes, exactly. And that's what I'm seeing. You know, spending time in Europe, you get so you get enamored with this, um, with the with this, uh, with these models and you, you, you can see them work. And yet they seem so radical to people here. They're really workable. I, so I guess building on, on Henry's comments, um, you know, one good thing to think about is you know, to talk to folks. Well, certainly, you know, it's good for our club to send a message to Assemblymember Holden, but it's also good for us to connect up with, with friends and co-conspirators in Assemblymember Holden's district to, um, to, to push as well. Maybe the local club in Pasadena and, and, and um, you know, who, who could also uh, uh, you know, weigh in with him and, and make sure they know that, that they're, you know, that they're, they're watching and that they're, they're really enthusiastic about the bill. Mm -hmm. Love it. Thanks. Dorothy, I'm going to give you what will likely be the last 
Maybe not the last word, but the last question. Okay. Well, uh, I guess I'll phrase it as a question, but uh, you know, the Republicans have been on a recall binge. Uh, they tried to recall Gavin. They, they're, they're, they've got the, the signatures to recall Chase Aboudin. Uh, yeah. And we had a little fundraiser thing for George Gascon and people who were there were saying that the Democratic Party has kind of left him hanging out there and the Democratic Party has not stood up for him. And I think we all worked hard to elect him, that we believe in what he's doing, that this recall is all bogus. The first recall was filed the day after he was sworn in and they were these people were told, oh, you have to wait 90 days. But this recall was planned before he was even elected. A lot of the things they're accusing him of doing are things he's mandating to mandated to do by state law. They say they catch a criminal, they let him go. Well, we all know they arrest somebody, they, they charge him. And then unless they're a danger to society, they have to let them out on bail or let them out on OR. You can't keep everybody you arrest in jail until their trial because it takes too long here. And it wouldn't be the right thing to do anyway. So um, I'm hoping that maybe we could put in a good word for George and that maybe Santa Monica Dem Club could uh, make a statement of support or something. Our club certainly has. I assume the party, I mean, the party's opposed to the recall, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're not doing anything for that. They're not saying anything. Yeah. I think some groups are taking a strategy where during the signature gathering, they're staying quiet and others are not. Um, and it hasn't looked super consistent. I think that we shouldn't stay quiet. I think that we should support support George and oppose this recall. And we should talk it up to our friends and people who are who are getting all the, for example, people. So my employees got robbed and the detectives called them, proactively called them at eight o'clock in the morning and said, oh, we caught your burglars, but George Gaston made us let them go. This is people on our dime calling. You know, on our tax dollars during their work hours calling. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of pressure they're telling. And they said, you should go find the recall petition. So please, if you see someone with a recall petition, tell them they're making a big mistake. They're also asking people to sign recall petitions and telling them that it's about um, child pornography or something. They're just lying. Mm -hmm. They brought in uh, petition gatherers, signature gatherers from out of state. One guy said that he was here from Florida. So this is this is really bad, and I'm hoping that I can encourage you guys to please take a stand and please talk to your friends. If someone says something, don't just nod your head, but but talk, you know, defend George. And if you need talking points, I'm happy to give them to you. Thanks, Dorothy. John, I'm going to check in with you because I want to be sensitive to time, but also yeah, yeah, that's perfect are. timing, uh, okay. Melissa. So we have some results to share. Man. I think we have to cut it, Sam. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to come back to Sam because we're going to oh, yeah. share the results, and we oh, do have okay. uh, we do have a round two, which means that we'll have some time to kill for a few minutes while we're going while we're all voting on the round two. Got it. Well, so, I just do I do want to just say thank you, Ben, for spending oh. time with us and being flexible and sharing all your good thoughts and being very candid. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank, thank you, guys. Ben. So good seeing everyone. Thanks, Ben. All right, so let's see what we got here. Results. Is this the right one? Yes, okay, so ballot number one. Uh, first race, Malia Cohen received 61% of the vote. I should mention that there were 61 ballots submitted. It says 96, but it's actually a little bit lower than that because we reserved 30 ballots for people who who uh, couldn't make it. So, or a certain number of ballots for people who, who uh, had some issue, which we had to give some of those ballots out. So 61 ballots vo voted and we got to 61% with Malia Cohen. The threshold for endorsement is 55%. So any number above that will be considered endorsed. So Malia Cohen is endorsed for insurance commissioner. Ricardo Lara received 84% of the vote. Mm -hmm. Next up for LA County Sheriff, Eric Strong is endorsed with 56.1% of the vote. Um, for the judge races, first up we have Timothy Rubin 
and about 89%. Uh, seat 60. Now this says that there's a winner, but it always declares a winner. It doesn't know that we have a threshold. So actually Anna Raytano felt a, fell a little bit short of that threshold, which means that we're going to uh. have to we're going to have a, a round two for that race. John, what is the threshold? A uh, fifty-five percent. Uh, so we'll we'll uh, have a round two for Anna Raytano and Sharon Ransom. And by the way, if you're uh, a candidate, you'll get a chance um, to speak while we're voting. So then the next race is seat sixty-seven. You can see we endorse Elizabeth Lashley Haynes. And next up is seat 70, Holly Hancock got the endorsement. Seat 90, we had an exact tie between Melissa Lyons and Kevin McGurk. And so that will be another runoff race uh, between those two candidates. Uh, Lloyd Handler got endorsed 84%. Seat 118, we had... Uh, no one got past the threshold, so we're going to have a runoff in that race with Georgia Huerta and Carolyn G. Young Park as the two candidates in that runoff. And then we have Patrick Hare endorsed 91% and Judge Carol Ellswick 93%. Then we go over to the other two ballots, and we see that Henry Stern is endorsed with 30 votes or 60%. Yay! And then uh, finally, Rick Spur endorsed with 90% of the vote. So uh, we can come back and look at those in a minute. But I, first things first, let's make sure everybody knows that you're about to get a second ballot. So everybody who got ballot one, you should expect to get ballot two. I mean, sorry, get this new ballot called um, runoff ballot. And it's going out right now. So the election's running and uh, the cutoff time is 1045. We have 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, so first, before we do anything, I wanted to invite any of the candidates who are here on the Zoom who are running in those three runoff races. So the six names are Sharon Ransom, Anna Raitano, Melissa Lyons, Kevin McGurk, Georgia Huerta, and Carolyn G. Young Park. So if any of the six of you are on the line now, raise your hand and let's give you uh, another minute to speak to the membership. If any of the endorsed candidates are, are on, say, have them say thank come, you and let them go. That'll, go. that'll come next, but we have an active election with people voting right now. So I wanna give those six people the chance to speak really quickly. So are any of those six people here? I see the hands are up. Okay, so we'll just go in the order that I see. So Anna. Sorry, my camera's not working. I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> That's okay. We hear you. Um, I'm just, I'm running to offer transparency and a viable alternative to the standard fair and judicial elections. I want to show a diverse perspective that also embraces the values of the voters through using the laws they enacted. Uh, you know, 97% of the uh, DAs voted to recall Gascon, a lawfully elected uh, official. Um, I just want to point that out. I'm a trial attorney at the Public Defender's Office in San Fernando. I have experience with everything from misdemeanors to murder. A public defender has never been elected as a judge. I plan to change that because I have the experience of knowing why people end up in the courts and how to stop them from coming back. I offer a depth of experience and substantive knowledge. In addition to trials, I work to do it better by appointing social workers, finding housing, treatment programs, obtaining mental health care, and seeking collaborative courts. Judges who don't have this experience are reluctant to try anything apart from what they're comfortable with. Time. When we only elect prosecutors, that means a focus on what we've been doing <coughs> the past 20 years, not where That's our laws time. are today or where they're heading. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Anna. And now let's go to uh, uh, Sharon Ransom. Go ahead, and you have one minute. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak again. Again, I would like to reiterate, when you take the bench and you don that black robe, you are not an advocate for the defense or the prosecution. You are uh, tasked with being fair and impartial and unbiased. 
diversity, again, is diversity in thought and appearance and in action. And what I learned about the criminal justice system is not what anyone um, told me or what I read, it's what I've lived. So I know diversity, I know the community, I was born and raised in the community. I bring balance to the bench, I bring perspective. Um, when you start trying to decide whether to elect DAs or public defenders, that's not the place for this. The place for this is to elect a fair, impartial, unbiased person with experience. Again, I've been rated well qualified by the LA County Bar Association. I've been endorsed by several democratic clubs as well as community leaders. Um, and I am the best candidate for this seat. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and uh, now let's go to uh, Georgia Huerta. Hi, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak once again. I just wanna sort of pick up from where I left off. I want um, each one of you to know that my last three years in the district attorney's office, I had really the opportunity and I think privilege to work in a special unit. It's called the alternative sentencing court. I really didn't tell you guys very much about it, but with all the issues facing Los Angeles as it relates to the homelessness, people with substance abuse problems, mental illness, sex trafficking, our at-risk youth and veterans, this is an awesome program. And it really opened my eyes to the need that we, especially if you take the bench, we need to be open to try to find the root causes of the in, root causes of why individuals are repeat offenders. I can tell you this is an awesome program. It's very effective. And not only that, it really changes people's lives. I want you to know that I'm a big person involved in community. The community helped my mother and the six of us as we were growing up. So I feel grateful to have an opportunity to give back to the community. That's why I'm so involved with the community through my church. We do feeding ministries for the homeless. We provide clothing for at-risk youth. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. <laughs> and uh, Carolyn G. Young. I think that I'm the only candidate in this entire race that has significant labor law experience. And given the multiple types of courts that exist in the LA Superior Court system, we need more attorneys who have diverse legal backgrounds. We have family, uh, civil, criminal, small claims, juvenile traffic and appellate courts pro and probate. I have been, what, what my role in the union was basically to be a public defender in a union setting. I've probably done about 60 hearings, many of which were five days long. And I've won people's jobs back. And I won a job back in LA Superior Court by overturning a state personnel board decision. This is, this is a question of whether you want the status quo and whether you want a perspective of someone who has been working with our communities directly. Thank you. Time, thank you. And uh, now let's hear from Melissa Lyons. I thought I saw her here. Is uh, Melissa I'm, here? I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you've heard, we don't get to choose what courts we go to. Um, just because we're prosecutors or public defenders does not mean we'll end up in a criminal court. We can get sent to any type of court in Los Angeles mm -hmm. County. And when someone walks into that courtroom, regardless of the side of the table or they're on, because most of the time people don't get to choose what side of the table they end up on. But what they wanna know is that when they walk into that courtroom, the person that they're being faced with as a judge is going to listen to them with an unbiased ear, with an open mind and with an eye on the law, on equity, on equality and on justice. And ultimately that's what you have as a candidate in me. And that comes from not just my work as a deputy district attorney, that's only a small part of who I am as a person. What it comes from 
is the people that are a part of my life, the work that I've come done in the community through volunteering. Um, and that didn't just start when I started campaigning. I've been doing that from a young age. And all of that, Time. that composite is who I am. And I hope to earn your support. Thank you, Melissa. And I didn't see him here, but I'll just ask if Kevin McGurk is here or anybody with his campaign. Okay, great. So the vote, vote is open. Everybody should have the ballot. I've already had the chance to vote. Um, we're, the ballot will be open until 1045. So we have 14 more minutes. Everybody get a chance to, to vote. And while we're waiting, we can uh, open the floor up. So um, Sam had his hand up earlier. So Sam, why don't we go to you and see what you got to say? Um, first of all, um, there is, for regarding the going against the recall, there is a weekly phone bank of the Working Families Party against the recall of Cesar Boudin. I'm starting to do that. And um, then there's another thing, uh, the question about Mark Levine, who claimed that uh, Ricardo Lara took from the insurance companies, similar to what Quackenbush did. I don't know whether you agree with this, whether this is a claim, just his claim or whether that's real. Anybody have any thoughts on, on that one? Okay. Uh, why don't we looking up the phone banks though, Sam? What is that? I said thanks for lifting up the phone banks in the other yeah, a lot of phone banking these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's a good time to <clears throat> to mention the phone bank. So I'll put those in the chat again. But uh, you know, we're we're going every Thursday. Uh, we have we have it available. I just put it in the, the link in the chat. We had um, a training this past Thursday. We'll have another one again this this coming Thursday, tomorrow night at six p.m. You go to that link that I just put in the chat, and uh, you can sign up. Come train with me. You'll see me sitting in this same seat, <laughs> except there's a few fewer people there and we're talking phone banking. So uh, you can sign up, sign up for that. Oh, uh, while we're waiting, also, Melissa, why don't you share the news about our next membership meeting? You read my mind because actually I was going to do that. And then it's a nice time to once again ask people for suggestions for folks they want to hear from or topics they want to hear about for July. Um, but for our June meeting, which I'll tell you the exact date, I will be the last Wednesday of the month, uh, we'll be talking with Attorney General Bonto, which is exciting. So that will happen the 29th of June. So mark your calendar. Think of some questions. That'll be good. And I am currently taking feedback, input, requests for either for the Ju July meeting, um, things you'd like to hear about, discussions you'd like to, that I could carry, yeah. or electeds you'd like to hear from that we haven't heard from recently. So I am, you can, um, I'll drop actually, I did this I think last meeting, but I'll drop my email in the chat. If you have any ideas, you can chat me here, you can shout them out either way, but Thanks. you can email me at the email I'm putting in the chat. Thanks, Melissa. And while we're waiting, we'll go back to Dorothy's suggestion from earlier, which we uh, meant to do next. So anybody who who has been announced as the endorsed candidate of the club, you know, can raise your hand and we'll call on you to to say a few words if you'd like, whoever's still here. Henry's still here. There he goes. Okay, let's go to Henry first. You have endurance, I will tell you. I'm <laughs> yeah. one of this group is like just all energy. It's incredible. Can you just my simple request and all my gratitude because this means so much to me. Really, I, I'm I'm overwhelmed a little bit, but I want in on this phone bank magic. Put, be, please embrace my campaign just with that vote. Please, please help me get through this. It it'll, it'll mean the world to me, and I'll I'll do it with you. So I'll buy pizza or whatever salad, whatever. We'll get creative. I'm coming. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Henry. And now let's go to uh, Rick Chavez Burr. Um, so I just want to thank you. I am so humbled and grateful to have your support. Um, I'm not going to get into thanking specific people because I know I'm going to leave someone out. Uh, although I do want to say uh, thanks, Shai, uh, in particular, for coming on board at a really crucial time on my campaign. And I just want to thank all my new friends at this club and my old friends at the club as well. Um, and I got to say that watching the deliberations on your judicial candidates, um, I was so impressed. I mean, um, I will in the future from now on, I think be looking at the Santa Monica Democratic Club as actually one of the more thoughtful um, clubs in terms of making endorsements for judicial candidates. So anyway, just wanted to give um, uh, a shout out to Mike and um, the other lawyers on the team and uh, the really thoughtful consideration of, of those. So anyway, I won't say more than that. You heard a lot from me a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm just humbled and grateful um, for your support. We're starting our full field effort. I think many of you are at my kickoff this weekend. We're walking precincts every weekend. We're doing phone banks and text banking during the week. Um, you should have started getting my mail and um, just want to thank you all. I uh, um, am really dedicated to sort of living up to the confidence that you're placing in me. I understand the um, how important that is. And um, as I think I mentioned to many of you, um, you know, um, you're not going to get rid of me. I'm going to be a, a fixture in Santa Monica and a partner for this club. And, um, and, and the last thing I also want to say is I do want to um, give a shout out to Louis. I, uh, I appreciate the, you know, really what a strong candidate he is and, um, and I'm very respectful and grateful um, to be in this race with him. So thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Rick. We're excited to be working with you. And yeah, we'll be sending out information to the members about how to get involved with your campaign and all the endorsed campaigns. Uh, but uh, now let's go to Eric Strong. Good evening, and thank you all so much. I think what Senator Stern said, um, you know, the the uh, amount of time that you put and the deliberation that you put into this uh, is, is nothing short of amazing. The, the endurance aspect of this is, is very much appreciated. Uh, you know, we have a lot of work to do you know, with law enforcement in our communities. And I'll tell you, it's gonna take somebody that just really cares and wants to put community first, and that's me. I wanna tell you all, thank you so much for taking the time to really look at the candidates. Uh, you know, they all have great resumes, you know, but what it's really gonna take is that person who is gonna work with you all individually as all the democratic clubs of all the communities and give everybody a seat at the table. Because the reality of it is, no one person can fix the problems that we have. It's gonna take a collective effort. So I just wanna give you my heartfelt thanks. Uh, I look forward to working with Santa Monica Democratic Club, anything that you need, I'll be there with the phone banking as well. Um, and just, uh, we are on a path right now with a lot of these endorsements that are really gonna make some positive change uh, moving forward uh, in 2023. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you all and I'm honored to be alongside uh, these other endorsed candidates. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric. And Patricia, before I go to you, I heard from one other candidate who's here who wanted to speak, uh, uh, Tony Vasquez. Tony? Good evening, Democrats. Uh, thank you for your endorsement. Really appreciate it. I've been blessed to have been endorsed by you every time I've run for office, going back to my city council days back in 1990. And I just wanted to thank you all and wish you all the best and whatever we can do to not only turn our local politics around, but also our state politics. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, let's go to Patricia now. Thanks, John. I, I, I want to congratulate you and, and all of us for getting through another uh, another heavy uh, endorsement meeting. I would like to ask if we ever have to do this again by Zoom instead of in person, that we give the judge, the judicial candidates a little bit longer. I don't know how many minutes we get, how many seconds we gave them each in their, um, in their initial comments, but they all 60, have so much. 60 seconds. Yeah, next time we have to do at least 90 and maybe even to 120. They, you know, it's great to hear from them. And when we're in person, you know, we can sort of pursue it further on the side, but over Zoom, we do need a little bit more. 
it didn't hurt. I think we did a great job in ferreting through what needed to be done. I think uh, I'm so happy to see you, Mr. Strong. We, Mr. Zabur, you know, Tony, I can call by his first name because we're old friends, but uh, it's, it's really, I think we did a great job and I, and I really appreciate the club and I really appreciate John. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patricia. Uh, do we have any other candidates on the line who wanted to, uh, who just got endorsed, uh, who wanted to say another word? You're welcome to it. Uh, I thought I saw Gavin Newsom here a minute ago. Uh, I guess he uh, just jumped off. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Oh, uh, didn't I just see Alex Padilla? Oh no, I guess it was. Guess it was someone else. Uh, okay, so um, have a few more minutes. Um, so I guess I just wanted to make sure everyone knows um, that our next meeting has already been mentioned, but might as well say it again, June 29th, we're gonna have Rob Bonta, our attorney general, speak to the club. And um, uh, but between- oh, John, yeah, I, think, I think Judge, I think Judge Ellswick. Els yes, that. Judge Ellswick, let's hear, from, let's hear from you now, go ahead. Thank you for your endorsement. Um, it means a lot to me. I wanted to thank the organization. The organization, um, you put in a lot of time. You put in your commitment to the process. That is so appreciative by myself and all of the other candidates, obviously. And it just shows how important this is to all of you and your group. And sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, I do want to thank you for your time and commitment because that means the most to all of us. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, I want to say one other thing. As a judge, I can't promise you uh, pizza. I can't promise you a party, but I'll do my best to be fair and impartial to everybody who comes before me. So thank you. Okay. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Judge. And uh, good luck on the campaign. And uh, Denny, go ahead. I just wanted to let folks know that, well, I'm certain you do know that there is a very important affordable housing measure being circulated in the city of uh, Santa Monica now collected signatures. In Los Angeles, um, a similar measure in a much larger community is going to have its signatures, its petitions turned in um, next Monday, and it fully expects to qualify for the ballot. Uh, that's a measure that could raise close to $900 million a year for homelessness prevention and affordable housing development. It's an amazing uh, measure and uh, parallels the local one we're considering here as well. So it may be a big year for affordable housing in LA, maybe in Santa Monica as well. Thanks, Denny. Yeah, let's hope. And uh, yeah, as to the ballot measure, you know, we, we talked about it at a special meeting last month, the one here in Santa Monica. And anyone who's interested in signing that, uh, the, the papers to get it on the ballot should definitely reach out to me or Michael Soloff and we'll get you connected to that drive. Uh, I don't know about you, but they actually came to my house and knocked on my door to get me to sign it. And then after I did, I showed them that my name was actually on the uh, papers. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, all right, anybody else? Any last thoughts? Very exciting year as we wait. Oh, I, I'll go back to what I was saying before. Uh, so. June 7th is the date of this primary election. Uh, the ballots are gonna be mailed like the 2020 election where everything automatically came to your house. Um, and so don't forget to vote by June 7th. Uh, before then, the club will be working with all of the candidates that we just endorsed to let all of you know about opportunities. So if you wanted to knock on doors to, to get the word out for some of these candidates, um, and the candidates will be in touch with us and we'll let you know how you can get more active and involved with those campaigns. Um, then we'll, we'll have some time off after the campaign, we'll come back refreshed and ready to go uh, on June 29th to hear from the Attorney General. Seconds to go here, A lot, some ballots came in at the last second. Uh, okay, let's still running. Completed. Okay, here we go. Which one is it? 
Sorry, it's getting late for me too. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Found it. Okay. Go to results. So on uh, the first race, uh, it's that we still don't have any candidate at 55%. And since there's only two candidates, we can't go on to a third round. So we're going to have no consensus on seat 60. On seat 90, we have uh, above the threshold with Melissa Lyons. So Melissa Lyons will get the endorsement. And finally, Georgia Huerta is just above the uh, threshold at 56%. So she'll get the endorsement as well. So we have no, uh, we have no consensus on seat number 60, but we do have two new additional endorsements for seat 90 and seat 118. So that's it. That's the end of the meeting. Uh, so thanks everybody. Uh, you know, enjoy it and we'll see you after the election. Don't forget to vote. Bye, John. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, and congratulations. Bye. Have a great night.